Willow Campbell. How are you doing on this fine afternoon? I'm doing great. You know why? Why? Because we're back at it again, recording another episode. Back at it again with the white vans. Yeah, recording another episode of Boozicals, a podcast Mm -hmm. where, in case you didn't know, Raven, you, Raven, and I, Campbell. Oh, me. Us. What is this? We have a fun cocktail and talk about musicals, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That is what we do. And today, we're talking about the good. We're talking about the great. Uh, The fantastic, the phenomenal. But before that, Mm -hmm. Campbell, what music have you been listening to? Uh, Well, Raven, in case you didn't know, very recently, some very dear friends of us, Uh, the band Mother Long Tongue, yes, came out with uh, their EP, which they're so geniusly titled EP (laughs) One. Which isn't this their second EP though? Because what was the first thing that they released? I think wasn't it like Collection One or something like that? Uh, that was I think, like I think what you they are called at first. I mean, let's just look it up. I have the time. <laughs> do do do. Quick, Raven, Vamp. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So Mud Long Tongue. Are it is friends. Collection One. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> I'm a true end, fan. End of that sentence. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so Mother Long Tongue, uh, we had them on for Happy Hour That's Special so 3. Three? Yes, Happy Hour Special 3. Um, so if you want to go back and check that out, we got to interview them. Um, yeah, their they're EP. They're, the work is always like just so good. I don't know. How, like, I'm not really a musician. Like well, I really just said I'm not a musician. I mean, I'm not a musician. Imposter but, like... syndrome <laughs> plagues us all. I'm in graduate school. I should know. Uh, you are a musician. I literally right? had a performance this morning. Um no. Yeah. What have you been listening to? I have been listening to... Okay, so do you know the artist Mooney Long? Yes. Okay, so I did not realize that... I mean, that's just her stage name. But I did not realize that she also has published music under her actual name, Priscilla Renee. Um, I didn't know that. And she had come out with an album. I was recently watching, like... Do you know the YouTube channel Terrell, where he, like, interviews different artists and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she was on there, and I was watching that that YouTube video. Um, the channel Terrell, check it out. It's really cool. Um, there's a lot of really cool artists on there. Um, and they were talking about her album, Colored, which came out in 2018. And Campbell, listen to it the next chance you get. Okay. Oh my God, shit will blow your mind. It's so... Uh, let me... It's so good. It's like this down. cool blend. It's called Colored with a U. Um, and the where's album the, Where's the art, U? C O L O U R E D. Say that again. C O L O U R E D. It's the European. Gotcha. Really. I was just yeah. like, like. Where's the U L? I think that was an honest question. Honestly. That's fair. That's fair. It's art. <laughs> um, but yeah, then the album art is like styled after like the color purple, um, mm-hmm. and the uh, just the music is like this cool Aren't blend of like so country and R and B. It's amazing. Didn't seeing the like the cast for the upcoming colored purple movie. Did you see yes. that? Yes. Do we want to did, talk did, about that? Didn't you? We don't have the time of day. That's but, true. That's true. But listeners, just you know, if you didn't see the cast, you can feel free to faint now. <laughs> I am very, very excited. Um but, that's gonna be fun. but on today's episode, we are here to talk Raven, about le- what are we talking about? What are we drinking? We're talking what are we doing? <laughs> Shut up. We're talking about the 2021 film Tick Tick Boom, um, which is a sort of biographical musical drama film directed by Lynn Man- Lynn Manuel Miranda, and it's based off the stage musical of the same name by Jonathan Larson. Um, oh. You may recall the name Jonathan Larson from our Rent episode with none other than the wonderful Catherine. Um, oh. I texted her after I watched this movie. I was like, "Hey, watch this immediately." <laughs> It's, oh my God, it's amazing. Um, But yeah, so Tick, Tick, Boom was the show that Larson did between Superbia and Rent. Um, And it was a small stage musical that was like mostly just himself kind of like talking and performing the songs with a couple with a band and a couple of other cast members. Um, So they did a film adaptation of that into the 2021 Netflix film. And it is fantastic. Like I, I honestly... 
I can't think of a better film adaptation of a stage musical. Chicago. Oh, fair. Okay, yes. Sorry. That, uh, that not to be... take away from Tick, Tick, Boom. But <laughs> not like, to take away I mean... from Tick, Tick, Boom. <laughs> but goddamn, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, but as, but I, think, I think as far as like what adapting a stage musical to film should, quote unquote, should mean, and how you can actually do that in a way that both honors the stage musical but also utilizes the new medium of film effectively i think this is probably one of the best adaptations that i've literally ever seen it's so like i there's so many points i just like was watch i was watching with my boyfriend i like i just realized i was like oh I think I'm crying right now. I was like, is this what's happening? You're just like, oh, I'm feeling so many feelings. <laughs> I haven't stopped listening to 3090. Oh my gosh. There's something, there's just something about this music and Andrew Garfield. Like, it's because I've Andrew liked Garfield's a lot of stuff. Andrew Garfield's perfect pick. Yeah, the perfect I, yeah I like a lot of stuff Andrew Garfield's been in. And I've like seen yeah. from some sources, I don't know how true it is, fake news prepare listeners but like he didn't really like sing before this movie yeah, that no. he like trained to sing like for this role and stuff like that um and isn't it so cool with like i don't know with anyone like celebrities people you know whatever if you've like seen their work or what they do for a long time but then you finally like see something that you're like no like this was m- seemingly made for you and, yes. like, the satisfaction and, like, that feeling that just uplifts you from watching it. This is how I feel yes. about Andrew Garfield in this role. Well, I was watching this interview that he did on some late night show. I forget which who the host was. I always get the mix Pick up. Pick a Jimmy. Um, honestly. Um, but I was watching this interview that he did. And apparently, Lin-Manuel Miranda called him up. It was like, hey, can you sing? And he was like when are you thinking of recording? And he was like, in a year. And he was like, yeah, I can sing. And then he promptly went and took singing lessons. (laughs) And like, was so good. So good. Anyway, before we like, you know, get into the musical. Raven, uh, what is, what am I drinking? (laughs) Okay. It was, there's a lot going on with it. And I'm very curious. Yes. Um, so I kind of went in a similar, but different direction than like greatest showman, because when I was watching this movie, I was like, I feel like this is like, Greatest Showman, but done better. Um, And so, and I was like, the feeling that I got from this musical was very sort of lofty and like idyllic in terms of like the type of world we could have, but also very grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. Um, And just a lot of craziness and chaos going on. So that is the energy that I put into this drink. So we have um, whiskey, chartreuse, fresh lemon juice, and then a chaotic simple syrup that I created, which is, um, it has lemon peel in it, rosemary, um, some elderflower liqueur, and uh, Earl Grey tea. So the chartreuse and the elderflower liqueur, I was like, okay, well, when I think of like groundedness and like being like down to earth and like earthiness um i think of chartreuse and elderflower um text message. oh fuck i forgot bitters oh so speaking of um also angostura bitters which like every time i was making this drink when i was workshopping it i kept forgetting the bitters and having to add them last minute um but yeah so i kind of wanted a lot of different balances going on in the drink um just because this movie gave me so many different feelings so yes yeah, so i was going for sort of like grounded but bubbly feeling um so you mix all those together and then top it with seltzer water in like a pint glass so the end result um should be the sort of like sweet but like with a sort of earthy flavor um and then like light and refreshing but especially because of the syrup and the whiskey still like like still full of flavor is what I was going for. And I think I achieved it. Um, I really liked the last time I made this drink. So let's uh, let's go ahead and cheers and see how you feel about it. Cheers. Cheers. See, the annoying thing is, Raven, about this drink, I could down 
10 of these right now. <laughs> I'm really glad you like it. This is so good. It also tastes a little different because um, I was telling Campbell listeners that when I was making, uh, when I was like practicing the drink or building the recipe, um, the salsa water I had was like halfway flat. So it didn't really, t it didn't have like a bubbly texture. It was just diluted. Um, it's definitely the, I think the bubbles give it, give it the extra little bit that I wanted. This is, this is, this is the drink for this movie. Right? <laughs> What's its name? Okay. What are you, what are you, <laughs> what are you noodling? So, okay. Top of the dome. Hit me. So, okay. So I was thinking something related to like Bohemia. Cause like, that's why I was getting like the, like down to earth, so like grounded feeling and like the chaos, the um, chaoticness. So I was thinking like boho days or like, I don't know, like something on the beach, but I don't want it to be on the beach cause they're from New York city. So, you know, um, mm. but I don't know something like that's like refreshing and like can be happy. You know? So I was thinking something like, like Boho or Boho Days or Bohemian mm -hmm. Rap. I did think Bohemian Rhapsody for a second, but I was like, wait, that's Queen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> this also, like, kind of reminds me of, I think, like, a really fun time in our lives where, like, when we would go to uh, City Dogs for, like, trivia. Ooh. And we would just hang out and stuff. And do you know what the picture we would always get? No. Natty Bo. Oh, that's right. A Natty Boho. <laughs> a Natty Boho. Because that is, so part of the uh, it, like, looks inspiration. Like a that was part of the inspiration for the color. And that's why at first I made it without ice. Because I want it in, in a pint glass. Yeah. I wanted it to look like a beer. Um, but then I was like, ah, I felt like it kind of needed ice. So I still ended up doing it over ice. But yeah. Um, I did so I, so I like I like Natty Boho. Um, I also had the thought Boho Days, but Days spelled D-A-Z-E. Um, but I like Natty Boho. And I feel it's like Natty Boho, I feel like Natty Boho gives it like the little bit of like trashy element. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> that like. I also wanted. Because <laughs> like I was trying like, to look like. look at his apartment. <laughs> oh, yeah. And like, I mean, that would be a kind of, I mean, if that was like today, you'd see a lot of like Bud Lights and like White Claws. For sure. Um, yes. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Natty Boho. I like that. Natty Boho. I I, like I love it. that. Awesome. Okay. We have a uh, name. Natty Boho. Hi, everyone. This is Raven and Campbell from Musicals, and we'd Hello. like to talk to you today about a nonprofit music education group that we are partnering with. Yep. We'd like to talk to you about Education Through Music. They partner with under-resourced schools to provide music as a core subject for all children, and they utilize music education as a catalyst to improve academic achievement, motivation for school, and self-confidence. Exactly. So they work with 52 different partner schools throughout New York City, um, and they work with them to institute sustainable music education programs by hiring qualified teachers, matching them with the school, and really equipping the teachers with the tools to succeed and be able to provide quality music education to all of the students attending that institution. So we think, you know, from this podcast, we think it's incredibly important to provide music education to all children, um, that everyone should have access to it to help, you know, really instill those lifelong passions that have been so influential for Campbell and I. So we believe that supporting this organization is the way you can support our podcast. Yep. And you can do so by going to give.etmonline.org slash boozicals. Again, that's give.etmonline.org slash boozicals. And yeah, you can really uh, help these kids if that's what you're into. Support the youths. Okay. Shut up. That's, don't, <laughs> don't, don't patronize me. Really. Okay. Uh, I don't need you Enjoy the episode. <laughs> I'm done with this. <laughs> okay. So let's get started. Uh, so. I need another sip. I need to prepare myself. <laughs> Um, so intro, we start on this, like, it looks like this VHS sort of like film tape. Um, yeah. and we see Andrew Garfield as Jonathan Larson performing this, uh, the musical Tick, Tick, Boom on stage. So he's wearing the yeah. same like t-shirt and I, either gray sweatpants or like jeans or something and Converse that he was actually wearing, um, during like the film, uh, the filmed the versions recording. of the yeah. yeah the recording of the stage musical so like that setup is all like i think uh directly modeled after after that performance yeah. um and they so kind of have... used that to bookend the story overall so like the yeah the story is being told 
through the lens of his Tick, Tick, Boom performance, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you said Andrew Garfield. Um, mm-hmm. Also been things like, you know, Hacksaw Ridge. Um, he was uh, Spider-Man in Amazing Spider-Man. Um, but like I said before, Andrew Garfield, Tick, Tick, Boom. Like, yes. I don't know what else to say. He was so incredible. So, yeah, you see him on stage with his band. Um, you hear more about his life. He's just, like, aspiring, like, musical theater writer uh, working in a diner. Mm-hmm. And he turns 30 soon. Yes. And, like, eight days or whatever. And we get into the song 3090. Um, I Boppity bop, bop, bop. love this song. I don't know. It's something like how he, I don't know, like the certain like notes he sings and how he like, uh, like the lengths of like the notes and the beats yeah, and just like the fervor behind it. I don't know. It just like make, does something with my body that I'm just yeah. like, I have to have more of this. And the interesting thing. And also what a thing, relatable ass song. What a relatable ass song. And the really cool thing, like musically, uh, we're going to put on a little musical theory analysis hat for a second um, of 3090. So I've, uh, Lynn Morrell Miranda talked about this in an interview that he did. And also, um, I guess other YouTube plug. I've been watching a lot of vid- musical analysis video essays. Um, there's a small YouTuber, Mateo. To only who did, my benefit. <laughs> who did a uh, musical analysis on the song Why and on this musical. Um, and in both of them, they talked about how in the intro to 3090, um, that opening riff, he doesn't actually repeat the phrase ever until the beat drops. Like every single time it's slightly different. And that's apparently supposed to kind of like symbolize um, how things are constantly changing and like how Ooh. you keep working and keep revising and keep like fixing it until you find the right like work the right thing this song made me feel pushed yes it it, it feels like time like literally time is ticking we yeah. gotta go you know time is tick tick booming um yeah. so this song 3090 it's like he turns 30 soon um what the fuck am i doing i have so much <laughs> i want to like accomplish and like sometimes when i think about it it's like oh, i'll be 30 next week and i just want to like cry but like my friends will be there um it's just like i like have like good things going for me but there's this like ever present like pressure that like Mm -hmm. in society and like mostly myself am putting on me and this situation that's just like can't fully you know the happy birthday can't fully like be into that um and the it's like very jovial but like pessimistic yeah that then switches to optimistic realistic mm-hmm. by the and, end of the song and so during this song he's talking about or like kind of the context for it is he's gearing up for a workshop to hopefully get his musical superbia produced on broadway yeah. and this is a musical he's been working broadway. on at this point for eight years yeah. so he's about to turn 30 he's been working on this one project since he was well not one he there were a couple other things he started including rent in that time um but he's been working on this since he was 22 and now he's about to turn 30 and he's just like fuck um, yeah uh i'm 28 <laughs> and i'm trying to have my phd before i turn 30 so i might have related somewhat to this song <laughs> um well, it also made me think of Bo Burnham's Inside, which I think yeah. would be really cool if we did that at some point, too. Oh, no, um, we already are with Kira. Did I not tell oh, you? Oh, that's right. That's right. You did. No, you did. Oh, I was like, I was like, I've already decided for the both of us. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, it also reminded up. me of Bo Burnham's Inside in that moment in the film where he, or the moment in the special, where he's like, I'm turning 30 in 30 seconds, you know? And it's like that whole moment. And I think in Bo Burnham's, he does a similar uh attempt as jonathan larson in this work to talk about like hey there's a bunch of shit going on in the world and i as a cishet white male care and like want to help but i physically don't know what to do and like Mm. i don't want to waste my life and like what do i how do i make sure that i'm contributing something great to the world knowing that time is ticking and i'm not going to live forever yeah yeah and that's like what this also just shout out so far um, like with his band, um, someone else sings in this song, but I'm just going to say the two other singers in the band just at this point. Um, in this song specifically, uh, Roger is singing, uh, played by Joshua Henry. I who's been love in, his voice. Uh, it's so good. Army Wives, 
Uh, he was Billy in the Carousel Revival, um, which I believe he received, like, a Tony and Grammy nomination for that. Uh, also, like, was very, very successful on Broadway and Violet and the Scottsboro Boys. Um, but also, also, because I know you would <laughs> love this fact, and also my mother, um, he was Aaron Burr in Hamilton in Amazing. Los Angeles. Which a lot of the reviews and critiques of, like, those performances were, like, he, this is Aaron Burr. Oh, that's awesome. And then, not in this song, but, like, a part of this band, we have, and honestly, the best role she's ever been in. I Vanessa love Hudgens. her in this. I Vanessa love Hudgens her in this. crushed this so fucking hard. Yes. Like, her, she is such a good singer. In some of the High School Musical movies that we've done, she's, like, been, like, the only saving grace. Like, her, like, singing. Her songs and, were the only good songs. <laughs> yeah. And then Sharpay in the first one. I love you, Ashley. Yes. Um, but she plays Caressa. So she's been in High School Musical, Spring Breakers, The Night Before Christmas, the Princess Switch movies. Mm-hmm. Her, she is so talented. <laughs> and this movie, like, if you didn't believe that before, for some reason, this movie will <laughs> solidify that. Because not only, it's, I feel like in this, she does something that, like, is very different from, like, some of the other kind of, like, musical singing related things she has done before but she is able to like fully act a whole spectrum of different dramatic and comedy aspects completely different from one another in each of the songs she's in yeah yeah and like it's it's really cool because in each of the songs she's in like she's in therapy yes because she's never, and I think it's interesting to the what this movie is set up to show, which is the life of a theater kid, like what it's literally yes. like to be in yes. this industry. And I think that's that's the cool part about Vanessa Hutchinson's character is that that happens because she's never singing as herself. She's we only ever see her performing as a character, um, and so you get to see her in all these different like styles and. But this time, uh, uh, her character is someone playing a character, and she does it yes. so well. And, yes. like, usually in the stuff I've seen of her, she's, like, she's the one that grounds everyone. Mm-hmm. And, like, all these, not just High School Musical, just, like, in everything, she was just like, okay, come back, solidified. And in this, she's just, she's still, like, that person when she's like, hey, you have a song, the song for me yet? Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, John's like, oh, not yet. But then when she's time, she's very like, patient okay. and like kind. She's of very it. patient. She was like, okay, she's like a professional. And then when she, it comes to like the performances she does, like her character is like, oh, now I'm in performance mode. She just gives it her all, like, and just like, t- it's just I don't know. I was so impressed with Vanessa Hudgens in this movie. Can we talk about how in that scene? So this is uh, well, we're jumping ahead, but anyway, doesn't um, matter. So when when he gives I'm so her the, excited. when he gives her the the final song at the workshop, it is an out. They've been rehearsing for a week. It is one hour before the performance, hey. basically. And he's like, "Can you sight read?" And she's yeah. like, "Yeah, he, no yeah. problem." She was like, "Yeah, of course, I'm a professional." <laughs> like she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and I just really like his band because throughout all of this, they are there. They have always yes. stuck around. Yeah. It's really cool to see. And, like, you see that as, like, his support network. Um, And I love that during, um, when they finally perform that song, you see uh, how the camera pans around to the different uh, faces of his support network and of his family um, at the end. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Um, Yeah. Um, uh, Amazing. Okay. Uh, Moving on. 39. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So then we get to, he's having a party at his apartment. Well, he, like, first we go to the diner. Yeah, sorry. Yes, we do. You're correct. And like he's at work, and his best friend Michael, played by Robin De Jesus, also been the boys in the band, Law and Order. Uh, in 2007, he played Sonny in in, in the Heights. Um, mm-hmm. Best friend all time is like making copies for him for like you know for like his show and things like that. And we're introduced to his coworkers at the diner, um, which are ugh, incredible people. Uh, we have <laughs> Carolyn. I love MJ her. Rodriguez. As she is incredible. If you're not familiar, which I I know we've gained a, like a lot a lot more listeners like recently. Um, so in the rent episode, we talked about Pose a lot because it was mm-hmm. like very relevant. Uh, she's Bianca in Pose. Um, 
incredible, 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 incredible. Fantastic. Fantastic um, I, I, I love her. And she was uh, Angel in the 2011 off-Broadway production of Rent. Mm-hmm. Which, you yeah. know, very fitting. And then we have Freddie, played by Ben Levy Ross, um, who was in River Fork. He was cast in the title role um, for, like, the National Dear Evan Hansen tour in 2018. Mm-hmm. He was cast as the title role. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so they're just, like, very supportive of him. And they're yeah. getting re- he's getting ready for a party. Yes. When he um, should be writing some damn music. <laughs> he should be writing some damn music. Um, oh, but we also see during this time, um, he talks a little bit about Susan um, and how she's into, mo- she moved to LA and like got into modern dance and mm-hmm. she's been touring with different like dance companies and is trying to basically like make it, make it big, like make make mm-hmm. a real, not quote unquote real, but like make a career out of it. Yeah. Uh, his girlfriend, uh, Susan, yeah. played by Alexander Schitt, um, who's also, also been with Simon. Also, freaking played Storm in X Men. Yep. Mm hmm. She's fantastic. And she, like, the, she the amount also of played... talent in this musical is insane. Especially, like, in the Sunday scene. Oh my god. Oh my god. We're going to talk about that when we get there. These characters but... are called Sunday Legends. <laughs> I mean, checks out. Yeah. Um, but she also portrayed Aaliyah in, I think it was Lifetime's feature mm-hmm, film mm-hmm. on Aaliyah. Yeah. And I think that was her first, at least like film singing role. Uh, so that was what kind Which, of like, like, put on the map as like a singer. Out of what all the first singing roles, <laughs> yeah, you Aaliyah? can do. Like... <laughs> Aaliyah? That's the first one you do? Okay. Oh my gosh. Um, but I mean, she can sing. Oh my gosh, she really can. And okay, so, so the party. we're finding out that, um, yeah, he's like, once a, he's going to quit his job and like, he was like, this is the, I'm getting ready for this workshop. It's the, it, this is my chance. And they're like, have it's going to change ta- my life. Yeah. yeah. He's like, have you talked to your agent who hasn't talked to him in months? Rosa. In a year. Uh, Rosa Stevens, played by Judith Light, um, who's been in American Crime Story, The Politician. Uh, she was in the, her Broadway debut was the 1975 revival of A Doll's House. She's Ooh. been in some off-Broadway stuff with... Um, she was a bunch of Law and Order, SVU, Ugly Betty, Transparent. Great actor. Amazing. As a manager, pays him no mind. <laughs> she she literally hasn't called this boy in a year. Um, and she's supposed to be getting producers for his workshop yeah. to get his uh uh, to get his musical back so that it can actually be put on on Broadway. Um. And yeah, he hasn't talked to him in a year, so he doesn't even know if people are coming. Um, yeah, and so and this is also all still going on during like thirty ninety. Yeah, so one of the, one of the I actually think is really cool is how uh, because again, Tick Tick Boom was just it was a stage performance, but it was mostly just a man at a piano. Um, yeah. It wasn't a it was a show, but it wasn't a pl- well, it was a play, but you know what I mean. Hopefully, yeah. um, so I really like the fact that they kind of spliced in the scenes from the tick tick boom performance and like quote unquote real life it's to like very much um and raven and i are gonna be really nerdy like we normally are but it's very much like if you have in D D like theater of the mind but yes. like the theater of the mind you is literally a theater <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's really cool and so then that performance kind of becomes yeah, like the soundtrack of his life which it, it was it was telling uh, this, that story for him. Yeah. Um, so I, I really think it's cool that they, they said like, well, this was Jonathan telling his story. So if we're going to tell his story, we should just let him do it. Um, so that was, that was really cool. Um, yeah. So we get to the party. Um, I love, so love we're, we're going around, we're being chat. introduced to different people. This is the first time we actually speak to Roger and Caressa. Um, and this Roger so cool. is with uh, his uh, friend who's in finance and is a, douche and i just really love when he's like so what do you do jonathan he's like i'm the future of musical theater scott and just yeah, like scott playing by ryan vasquez <laughs> uh like it's it's like what do you think like like i'm gonna get another yeah, drink here. and he's just like uh, he's like yeah i like uh, i did like theater like plays in high school <laughs> <laughs> he's like get out of here like, okay troy bolton um <laughs> okay troy <laughs> literally 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it seems like a really so fun they, party. Don't you miss like having parties like that at like people's I, apartments when you're living oh in a city? Oh my gosh. It's so fun. That is something that I really, that's like the only thing that's missing for me from Harrisonburg. It's just like <laughs> that Richmond sort of like city boho vibe, you know? Yeah, let's just Well, go Richmond is more of a hipster vibe, but. Yeah, I mean, I mean. Similar was, enough. Yeah, there's, that, that's a Venn diagram. Um, yes. <laughs> there's, I miss it so much. Just like, yeah. it's stupid COVID for many reasons, but mostly so I don't party as much. Not, you, know, <laughs> the, you know, hundreds of thousands of people dying. Um, Correct. Uh, just seems really fun. Yeah. Turning 30 um, in the 90s. And this was always my dream because, like, we have so many musical friends, and I like just once want to have a spontaneous acapella sing along at a house party the way they do when we get into the song "This Is the Life." That's all I want, Campbell. Uh, boho That's all days. I want. Boho days. Yeah. No. Um, how did I mess oh. that up? That's what I was going to name the drink. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. But also, right before we're like talking more to like Carolyn and Freddie, and we hear that. Uh, Freddie got like a, like a gig, but it's on a cruise, and they're like you know undercurrent because it's the '90s, and it's you mm-hmm. know fueled a lot of Jonathan Larson's work with like you know the lives of his friends and the people he really cares about, and just the world. And they ask about Freddie saying he's doing a lot better. His like T cell count's doing really well. Yes, which tells the listeners that he's generally healthy, but he has H- he uh, is HIV positive. Yeah. Um, so he's actively in treatment and like, that's kind of a, a story thread throughout the movie. Um, cause, you know, yeah. Cause this, this is taking place in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, well in 1990 when, um, the AIDS epidemic was at one of its peaks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we get into boho days and man, like this is the life, like shower in the kitchen, <laughs> rotating roommates. That was fun, though. So he goes through this list of, like, 14 different roommates. Uh, Amazing. Um, That's a fun little song. Susan's face when he's like, I thought by now I'd have a dog, a kid, and a wife. And she was like, "Uh, okay. (laughs) You thought. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I don't know what he he said, but the next thing I wrote down was, shut up, Scott. Yeah, man. Shut up, Mm. Scott. Who knows? (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's it's a fun little song. It's just like, I don't know, they're having, they're, you know, artistic, theater, musically inclined people, and they're just like yeah. enjoying themselves, living in the yeah. moment. Just all hanging out, bo-bo, vibing, bo-bo, having bo-bo. fun. It's amazing. Um, so then the song ends, and we kind of cut a little bit, and we see Susan is out on the roof, balcony. Not yes. entirely sure what that space of the building is. Um, roof. Yeah, roof. Um, so she's on the roof, and we see. John to come out and talk to her and she tells him about this job that's being advertised for a dance teacher that's up in like the Berkshires. Um, yeah. Which I don't know much about New York geography, but I take it that that is far away from New York city where he lives. Especially in the nineties. Especially um, in the nineties. Yeah. Um, and he was like, so, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, uh, hunt acorns, gather squirrels. Um, <laughs> And he's just like, you know, she's trying to have a real conversation with him, but he's partying. He, yeah. And so he's, he's, he's just, can we go inside? High. He was like, can we go inside? We're cold. She was like, take my jacket. And like, when I saw Ooh. this green, Ooh. green Ooh. dress. Alexandra Ship in green is a dream. Yeah. Like when we were watching it, we're just like, ooh, oh, ooh. look at you. And then we get into green, green dress, which I would like to be like to call fucking music oh correct um (laughs) also i thought it was really cool that when she first takes her coat off and you see the dress right before they start fucking in the song plays um we do hear a little refrain from uh come to your senses like later (gasps) on Mm, Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. little musical tidbit um Mm, and yeah so they're making out um doing doing the doing the dirty doing the do Mm -hmm. um and she tells them like Hey, uh, making the beast with two backs. Um, like, hey, you remember that job that I just told you about five minutes ago? Yeah, um, I already applied and I interviewed and I already got the job and I they need a decision in like three days. <laughs> yeah, um, I do think I understand the urgency. I feel like that could wait post coitus. 
Disagree. Um, <laughs> here, here's why. Here's why. Because I'm a girl, and I understand her, and she did that on purpose. So. No, no, one hundred percent. No, I get it. But if she really wanted it, like a definitive answer, if she really wanted. She was not going to. Discussion. She was not going to get it in that moment. Yeah. Um, bo 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 bo. Yeah, correct. Because um, I also <laughs> thought it was interesting. I was like, I get why she's upset with him later on and that like he's avoiding the issue and like not talking to her about it but at the same time it's like okay but you could have told him before you got the job like you could have told him when you were actually considering applying although instead of like it does seem like yeah she could have but would he have really listened which is fair like i there's definitely like you definitely get the sense with their like relationship dynamic that but they, they they actively say it that he's not like great at talking about his feelings and sharing his feelings and like having those sorts of discussions. So I can understand why that would have been really difficult for her. But at the same time saying like, you sort of ambushed him by telling him like, hey, there's a job. Also, I already applied. Also, I already got it. Um, so it's just like, I just, I don't know. I just feel like we need to look at both partners' perspectives. <laughs> no, I believe in women. <laughs> I believe women, Rihanna. I hate women. Yeah, that's what you said in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> true we also hate orphans i mean that's that's both of us <laughs> okay. but it's not all orphans just those orphans specifically we like the just orphans those the stupid of fucking orphans and annie ah uh, so yeah so then it's like the next day or whatever and jonathan is talking to michael um and he's like talking ab- like kind of talking about the issue with susan about like hey what do i do like blah 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 um, and Michael's sort of telling him, like, they're in his car at first, and he's like, hey, you know, like, maybe it would, it could be a good idea for you to, like, have I a change of pace, you. go somewhere <laughs> new, maybe actually, like, have a job and, like, get to produce stuff and, like, maybe stop working on the one play that you've been working on for eight years and haven't made really any progress on. Yeah. Um, well, not and not made progress on, because he's getting ready to, like, show it to producers, but, like, it's been eight years. Yeah. Um, yeah. and we find Michael works for this advertising company and he was like an aspiring actor they like Mm -hmm. we'll find out later they like moved to new york together we're gonna do it together and he's just like i i'm not about this rat race i was a mediocre actor this is what i'm doing now and he's trying Mm -hmm. to it's like have you thought about jingle writing and because jonathan Jonathan. does say later on that he doesn't exercise to see if he can write a song about anything and jingles jingles can use that jingle all the way indeed um, so Michael's just trying to explain it and we get like, he like gives his keys to the parking attendant. Tosses at his, apartment, his keys to the parking attendant. And we get into the song No More, which is just a really fun song looking at, um, yeah, disparity is the right word, uh, mm-hmm. between their like, because Michael like was like living, Massive currently still living, disparity. this is where he's like moving into, yeah. um, just like different living situations and what could be if he Mm -hmm. got a well-paying job stable stable well-paying job yes um that is not in the arts um and i really love the dichotomy i guess um of so there's like two main like major musical themes in this song one is like the heavy like rock but like the Mm -hmm. heavy um uh drums like percussion um and then it transitions to this like ballet um Mm -hmm. is it it's not a waltz because it's not in three four uh but it's like that lilting it's like that lilting sort of lilting's the right yeah yeah and it's I really love just, like, how they go side by side and, like, how it goes back and forth between them. Um, I don't know. I I just think it's really cool because I don't think I would, like, I don't know. I feel like that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, it is very difficult. And some of the stuff, like, yeah, of course, I've never lived in a place where, like, the shower was in the kitchen. But having to, like, like, you know, walk a while when it's cold, going to a laundromat, walking up all these stairs in this apartment building you're in, they're all very relatable things. Yeah. Living in living in small apartments is rough, and I can only imagine living in a small apartment in New York City as a struggling artist. any person, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. Um, but like like struggling artists, especially like it's it's not a fun life. Yeah. Um, but this is a really fun fa- fantasy for them. They're moving on up. 
Yeah. Um, to the inside. the inside. I loved the way they like mashed in the Jefferson, uh, the Jefferson's theme. Um, yeah. That was really, really cool. Um, but I also think it's really interesting like that you talked about the disparity um, financially between the two of them because um, earlier during 3090, uh, we had sort of a small scene that I think was kind of like showing uh, some sort of like privilege slash like disparity between like Jonathan and Michael when like Michael was talking about when he was talking about quitting when he was talking about like you know what fuck this like I'm tired of being called like 15 different names like Jose and Juan and like all these different names and like being just like completely ignored and like overlooked and blah 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 and like that was when he went into like finances and now we see like there's a completely different type of disparity between them um, based on their like two new worlds now. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, cheers. Cheers. So So, now we get back to the diner. He's uh, Jonathan's in a meeting with uh, Ira uh, Weitzman. 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 Uh, Played by Jonathan Mark Sherman, who's also been in like a skate bar displays, a bunch of things. Um, And he's the one that's like supporting like him to put on this workshop. Yeah, he's the head of like a musical theater theater um, group Conclave. whatever. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so he's he's helping to like put on the workshop that will get producers and backers for his work to be actually produced on Broadway. Yeah. Um yeah, so and he was like see... talking about well, like the main thing like yeah. the means like he's good, he like believes in it and he was like saying that you need to finish it though um like there's an extra song that needs to be written yeah that like the main uh, elizabeth she needs like a closing song yeah and he's like um, otherwise has it's kind no of one... like a story thread that doesn't go anywhere he's like has no one ever told you that before he's like in what five years that? of working on this musical no one's ever told you that you that you're missing a song in the second act um and exactly yeah one person who was that one person? Minor, insignificant person who told him this. Oh, uh, now I'm tearing up. Uh, rest in peace, Stephen Sondheim. <sighs> rest in peace. And so we, like, go, like, flashback. He was part of, not a flashback, because now he's just describing it, because in Tick, Tick, Boom, he's just describing, like, these different events, like, while he's, mm-hmm. like, you know, playing and singing and whatever. He was part of a musical theater writing workshop. And he would present to writers, like Broadway folks, like just like a professional panel, um, what's going on. So the two people that were like giving critiques were Stephen Sondheim, but also, uh, what's the character's name? He was played by Richard Kind. Uh, Walter Bloom. I was just thinking of him as Richard Kind. I forgot he even had a name. Walter Bloom, played by Richard Kind, um, Hmm. who's also been like, you know, he was Bing Bong. Yes, bong, Richard Kind is just doing the Goldbergs, what Richard American Kind Dad, does Argo, best Big in the scene. Um, I love him in Scrubs as Mr. Corman. Oh, he's fantastic. Love, 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 love. Um, and then we also have Stephen Sondheim, who's played by Bradley Whitford. Who's I been love in, Bradley Whitford. He's so, so He's talented. amazing in West Wing. Uh, West Wing. West Wing. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Get Out. Saving Mr. Banks. The Handmaid's Tale. Like, mm-hmm. ugh talk about prolific so uh, plays so steven sondheim and does it well does it so well um yeah so steve so the interesting thing walter about... bloom is just like this sucks I like he's like oh there's like no good like songs or whatever and steven should be like, so I was like no, there's actually a lot of i completely songs disagree it's really really yeah, good and he's like well yes of course we're, yeah, saying, we're saying the, the same, same thing. thing just in different <laughs> ways <laughs> um but the, the really cool thing about steven sondheim being portrayed in this in this movie is um the significance of him being here is that he helped mentor Jonathan Larson for a time um, up until his death, and uh, we saw Spoiler. that a couple times in their. <laughs> we saw that a couple times in his. It's like, not something to laugh about, Raven. <laughs> <laughs> um, we saw that a couple times in their interaction, uh, but the really cool thing about that relationship and how this movie was made. So Stephen Sondheim was mentored himself by Oscar Hammerstein, which we talked about. In I believe the Sweeney Todd episode, Probably. and then he helped mentor Jonathan Larson, who was an inspiration for Lin Manuel Miranda, and Lin Manuel Miranda was also mentored by Stephen Sondheim when he was coming up. So like, and this movie was directed by Lin Manuel Miranda, which was his feature debut as a director. So it's just like, 
it's so cool seeing this relationship of like fantastic musical like, theater families generation breaking composers um yeah. who have all been kind of part of this chain um and it's just it's it was just so cool it's electric seeing... I'm done with you. Um, so yeah, Stephen Sondheim loves it. He says, um, first rate lyric in tune, which I can only imagine how that would like, feed one's soul <laughs> for and like, yeah, months, uh, decades John to come. said that like fueled him for the next two years. I was like, try the rest of your life. I feel like, that. I feel that. Um, yeah, Walter doesn't know what the musical is. Um, and Stephen does says the details distract from characters. That's why he needs you need Elizabeth to have like a like a another song in the second act, and specifically she needs a song to like wake up the main character to wake him up and quote shake some sense into him, and the song ends up being named "Come to Your Senses." So yeah, yeah. Um, and then we get so then we like come back to the diner, and uh, there's only four musicians, and uh, John's like I need two more. Um, and he's like, okay, that's cool. But like, we have like no RSVPs, RSVPs. You have like 12 RSVPs. You're like, like... you're like managers, Rosa. She has so many, like, she can like get so many good people to come to this. Have you talked to her? Yeah. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Like I'm working with her. Yeah. I talk to her all the time. Sure. And then we see John leaving messages for everyone. Um, yeah. Undercurrent (laughs) of what's going on, looking at bills that are not being paid. At one point in the montage, he's, when he's calling producers, at one point he refers to the theater, uh, I think it's called Playwright Solutions, he says Playwright Psoriasis, which I just thought was really funny. <laughs> yeah. so then also we get a to... fun wordplay, because psoriasis doesn't actually start with an S, it starts with a P. I didn't know that. that was P-S- P-S- oh. P-S-O-R-I-A-S-I-S. That's how you spell psoriasis. You're okay, welcome. Okay, a keel and a B. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my, uh, when that movie came out, my parents went to took, take me to it be, because they, they wanted me to be that. <laughs> I love you. Also, parents. my dad looked like Lawrence Fishburne, and a kid came up to him in oh the movie and asked, him, and asked him for his autograph. <laughs> and he signed it as himself. So, <laughs> I mean, the fact that he signed anything is just like, suspect, though. Raven, like, like, Raven, I, like, I understand what you're trying to say, but he still gave his autograph. <laughs> We were just like, oh, that's so cute. Did you sign it as Lawrence Fishburne? He was like, no. <laughs> I signed it as myself. Um, uh, but yeah. <laughs> wild. Uh, your family's so much fun. Um, so then we see, like, uh, Susan, John, and Michael are, like, watching TV. Yeah. Uh, what were they watching again? Was it, uh, like, so, was it Sunday in the Park with George? Susan, John, and... No, when they're, well, they're okay. like, on the couch, they're watching the TV. So the next thing I have is when I, I think I just have Johnny watching TV and like there's a, a news clip on from C-SPAN uh, that has Senator Jesse Helms. Oh, on. no, it's before I think that might have been like, it was It was like at night. I know what you're talking about. I don't know what it was, though. I didn't write it down. Was that Sunday in the Tar- Park with George or our musical theater I think people so, going but to I, yell at me? I would not be. Isn't that, I'm not painting, the isn't that painting the pointillism painting called Sunday in the Park? I think so. Yeah, so that would make yes. sense because they were watching a musical. It would make sense to me that study. It would make sense for it to be that. Yes. Yeah. Po- yeah. Uh, pointillism, really fun style of art. Um, yeah. So we see like the news. Um, Jesse Helms, aka Satan, one of his worshippers, mm-hmm. um, is Satan talking. Kind of. Who's a North Carolina senator is talking about how you know I I can solve the whole AIDS problem. They should just stop being gay. If you just stop stopped living other. in sin, Campbell, your life I mean, would be easy. <laughs> yeah, I would be able to give blood to the Red Cross. Fuck it's, it's you. It's a choice. It it's is a choice. choice and I also choose to be on prep and be tested for HIV every three months. Yeah. I still can't um, give blood. We get into the song, Johnny Can't Decide. Yeah, because so Susan this, yeah. needs an answer by Wednesday. Yes. So this is currently Sunday, I think, or Monday? Yeah, Sunday, because uh, it's before, yes. Um, yeah, so we get into the song Johnny Can't Decide, um, and this is all about him, like, 
trying to figure out it's it's sort of both him trying to write the song that needs to be written before he can do his workshop but also more importantly um about what the decision he has to make with susan about like one i love her um, I'm not great at showing that I love her. I'm not great at like sharing my feelings. I want to stay with her, but she wants to go to the Berkshires and like she's always wanted that. Like she wants to live by the sea, but I want to stay in New York City and like be like get big and like and uh, produce my work and do the work that I long to do. Um, and like, how do we resolve that? Like, how do we come to yeah. a uh, compromise? At the same time, he's thinking about his situation with Michael. That was like, oh, Michael has got to have it all. This is not the life I want that I'm being pressured with. Also, Freddie's in the emergency room. Uh, Carolyn yeah. tells him, like, uh, his, like, you know, took a turn for the worse. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's like, oh, I, need, I should go to the hospital. I need to write. What about Susan? It's just, like, he is overwhelmed with everything going on in his life. And so yeah. Johnny can't decide is, like, I can't. I can't prioritize because I am overwhelmed with decisions and I feel things sleep slipping away. Yes. Which like when, so I don't know how you felt Campbell, but for me watching this movie, part of the reason it was so, I guess in, in engaging, but also like, I'll say enthralling. The part of the reason it was so enthralling for me is because I relate to Jonathan more than I care to admit. Girl, same. <laughs> like it was, I was like, I was like, like so oh, many times I was just you're like you're literally me though. I was like you also have ADHD and does don't know what to do sometimes and overwhelmed with I was saying yes to everything all the time. Yes. <laughs> um and and getting into this this moment where it's like it's not that I don't think these scenes are important. It's not it's not that he doesn't want to visit Freddie. It's not that he doesn't want well he kind of doesn't want to talk to Susan about Oh uh, no, he definitely does. But want to talk yeah. To Susan. <laughs> Um, but it's not that he doesn't want to like visit Freddie or do any things or go talk to Michael or any of that stuff. But it's just that like there's so much going on that he physically can't make sense of everything happening. You yeah. know, static in his brain. Yeah, which I think is shown really well later, like visually when we get to swimming. So we'll wait till we get there to like talk oh, a little yeah. bit more about that. Um, so we go to the Moon Dance Diner. Yeah, um, well, a lot of this, and you, like, finds out about Freddy. We're at the Moon yes. Dance Diner. And then it's 9.30 on a Sunday, which means... Brunch time. Brunch time. Also, real and quick, what gives we get you... a Lin-Manuel Miranda cameo as the cook. Just, like, oh, just yeah. before we go into the yeah. song. Yes. And, um, like, what gives you more life than Renee Elise Goldsberry asking for Bailey's for a coffee? Right? And Philippa Sue. And it's just like, can I get orange juice? Like, he's like, yeah, get her her Bailey's. Like, uh Campbell, can you do us the very great honor of, if you haven't, I assume you do, running down the list of all of the Sunday legends that we see during Sunday brunch here? Okay, so the song is called Sunday, and it's really, really fun. Um, and we're we're going to talk like, about it in a second. Yeah, okay. But the people, the, you know, really annoying people that will come in... And like the like houseless people outside, the bums that Jonathan mm-hmm. calls them, are credited as Sunday legends. Let's let's take a look inside Love a it. book, reading Rainbow. <laughs> we have Chuck Cooper, who was in Memphis in uh, the life. He was in Chicago. He was in Passion, uh, St. Louis Women. There is Andre De Shields, The Wiz, Play On, The Full Monty, Wharf, Clams on the Half Shell, Renee Elise Goldsberry, Angelica, and. Hamilton, but she was also Nala in The Lion King. Mm-hmm. There's Joel Grey, who is Master of Ceremonies in Cabaret. Amazing. Uh, there's uh, Wilson Jermaine Herida, who is uh, the originally Angel in Rent. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, there's Beth Malone, who is in Fun Home, Ring of Fire, Angels in America, Howard McGillen, who was the longest-running Phantom of the Phantom of the Opera. There's Brian Stones Mitchell, who was in... Uh, who is Jethro in Prince of Egypt. Uh, he won Tony for his role in Kiss Me, Kate. Uh, B.B. Uh, Nerith, who is in Su- uh, Sweet Charity. And also she was in Cheers for a while and like did, was really successful in that. There's Adam Pascal, who was Roger in Rent, but he was also in School of Rock. Check out the Rent episode. We talk more about him. Uh, yeah. Fucking Bernadette Peters, who we will never stop talking about. Never. Um, some other things, like other than what we've discussed before like sunday in the park with george uh into the well we talk about into the woods annie and she was in the muppet show mm-hmm. uh felicia rashad oh man 
A Raising the Sun, but also Claire Huxtable. Yes. I was like, when are you going to get to her? <laughs> Don't worry. It's I think it's alphabetical. Uh, Cheetah okay. Rivera, Bye Bye Birdie, um, Kiss of the Spider Woman, Daphne Ruba in, Vega, uh, in, in, in the Heights, Mimi in Rent on Broadway, but not in the 2005 in the movie that was Rosario Darson. Uh, yep. She was pregnant at the time. And Philip Sue. Eliza. Those are the Sunday legends that just have this, like, one song just kind of like, you know, just like here and there. Uh, some so people amazing. may like think they're just like you know background actors stuff like that it's like oh just part of an ensemble or just like random old people no <laughs> each and every one of them is a legend in themselves in the musical yes. community and like when I was watching this because I was trying to pay attention to the lyrics it was really funny um, the Sunday is kind of like for like Stephen Sondheim the Sondheim um mm -hmm. and like i kept on like seeing at first i was like oh, okay cool i was like oh there's angelica and eliza that's so funny and i kept on seeing more people i was just like was like, was like oh, wait. good god i was like wait wait no i was like oh i know i oh i know i knew you oh 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 whoa what are they doing <laughs> what is happening here oh also something i didn't i forgot to mention i like i don't know we talked about like going over this musical and stuff I had yeah. no idea what it was about. I forgot that oh, Jonathan see, Larson did Tick, Tick, Boom. And so oh, first, I, was I, like, I was like, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, I was like, this guy, Jonathan. And then all of a sudden, I was like, wait. No, wait, this is Jonathan, Jonathan Larson. <laughs> oh, this is Tick, Tick, Boom. Oh, oh. This is going to oh. fuck me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew, I knew that it was by Jonathan Larson, but I knew nothing else about the musical. I didn't know how it was originally performed, what yeah. it was about, like, anything. So, yeah, I, I feel like we both kind of went into this cult, which was really cool. Um, the yeah, fucking so harmonies that which these only they people... Do. Which only they can do. And, like, I think the really cool thing, because we talked a, a little bit about how the way Lynn Lin Miranda did this entire musical is, so, is sort of showing the life of the theater kid and like the the different like the different things that that can mean being an actor and going from you know pursuing a life of art and life of theater to going into like quote unquote mainstream corporate america versus like becoming like a playwright versus being a dancer being a vocalist like etc but i think for the i think the musical generally does a really good job of keeping it again grounded so that like if you're not a theater kid if you're not someone who like knows that world it's still very much like you still very much understand the story very much understand the characters like it's not crazy out there this is probably the one scene where it's like there are a lot of nods that might go over non-theater people's heads yeah. it's just like they might not recognize a lot of the faces but i think this scene is fine without that like, even if you it, don't recognize the people the music is amazing the scene yeah. like the stylized the stylism is fantastic like it's all also really it's not for them it's not for them. <laughs> yeah, this it's, scene it's especially not is not for them. Yeah. I really I really like that this scene is the one, like, fantastical one um, because the of all the incorporation of all the different home. legends. Yeah. I have never felt more attacked about Sunday brunch. Like, now I'm starting to feel guilty about going wait, to Millie's or wait, Lulu's. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what do you mean, feel attacked? Because I was like, yeah. Because I'm one of the somewhere. fools that would pay less at home. <laughs> No, no, but, like, I feel like the point they're trying to, like, say is just, like, oh, these are bad customers. Oh, gotcha. And then when you said, I feel attacked, <laughs> it worried me about your character. No, I really try to be kind to service workers because, I mean, they're people. Um, but, no, Wild I concept. just... I just, like, I mean, because it's one of those things, to, like, brunch is never not busy. Yeah, but like, at the same I've time... I've never been to... It's a it's a diner, it's a That's restaurant. Fair. You can you can eat at an establishment without being a dick. Oh, facts. call it a hot take, but facts. Also, for anyone who doesn't know this, um, in most establishment, the server does not, in fact, make your food, and you yelling at them for it being made wrong or just like a mistake that was made with the order because people are human. Also, tip is twenty percent. What the fuck are you doing? Oh yeah. Well, also restaurants need to pay, pay a livable wage, which also means like minimum wage needs to be raised. Two things like, can also, happen yeah. at the same time. Two things can happen at the exclusive. same time. You can treat a person like a person and also pay them a livable wage. It's, it's... Yeah, it's like yeah, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. yeah this yeah, yeah, is, yeah. song is so funny. 
This song is hilarious. He's just shading the fuck out of these people. <laughs> also, how cool was it that the front of the diner turned into a stage? Just turned into a stage. And that, oh my gosh, and the crescendo as they all f- come together to form this like chorus together. And then it ends well, in that people final People are screaming low for their note. toast. <sighs> it's just so On an ordinary fantastic. Sunday. And then it also turns into pointillism again. Yes. Uh, it's just so well like and I, I like I like the imagery of Jonathan Larson stepping out in front and like sort of being the conductor of like his own life because like this is the way he's like making I like to think of the songs in Tick Tick Boom and the way they're being shown to sort of be the soundtrack for his life and for the yeah. story of his life I like to think that like similar to um I guess like Chicago, where the songs were all happening in people's heads. Like they were yeah. all stylized. Theater of the Mind. Theater of the Mind. And similar, sim- I think Lin Manuel Miranda kind of did a similar thing in this movie where you definitely get the sense that, like, yeah, this isn't happening in real life. In real life, he's serving Sunday brunch as a waiter, but like, this is what he's seeing in his mind. And it's, I think it, uh, seeing him at the, as the conductor and like trying to make sense of this chaos um, also gives us another look into Jonathan's mind and like how he sees the world and, and what he's going through life as. Yeah. Well, it's halftime, sports fans. Um, I don't. I don't know why I said that. Anyway, it's Campbell from Boost Coles. Uh, I'd like to tell you all about Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. This foundation keeps music alive in schools by providing vital support services to school districts and new musical instruments to underfunded music programs nationwide, giving underrepresented youth access to the many benefits of music education, leading them to success in school, and inspiring creativity and expression through playing music. There have been over 34,000 donated instruments and over 2 million students impacted by this organization. Some of the support services they offer are professional development for music teachers led by certified uh, instrument repair technicians and further community engagement and instrument drives, just to name a few. Again, Raven and I believe the best way to support us as a podcast is to support organizations like Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation that supports music education and the passion of music in our youth. You can donate at mhopus.org slash donate again that's mhopus.org slash donate uh back to our nonsense so now it's yeah. monday which is the first Correct. day of rehearsal the first day of rehearsal so, we, so he's we, headed we, to we, the theater district yeah so we see like kind of like the ensemble and just like to list some of them uh kristen like the one of the main women played by yep. giselle jimenez there's kate rockwell as lauren and Issa falls as dan uh dania and joel perez and lincoln um there's like a lot more there's so many credits i'm not gonna be able to say everyone but that's fine yeah i loved giselle jimenez she does such a yes. good job She's the one that's doing that first song from Superbia yes. when he's yes. yeah. So I think um, I, there's somewhere else that I think it comes back, but I think the opening phrase of that song, uh, everyone who's everyone who's anyone or everyone who's ever whoever has or ever will be anyone will be there. Um, yeah. That the opening phrase of that song, I think, is at least paralleled with the opening phrase of Thirty Ninety. But I think in a different key or a different oh, I see uh, that. chord. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I thought, I thought that was cool that those were basically the same. But we we missed... Um, so on his way to the rehearsal studio, um, we hear the song Play Game. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, so he passes a Which buster on we, the street. Oh. How I apo- you know what? I apologize. No, you're fine. I <laughs> need to be held accountable for my actions. Um, yeah, why'd you, why'd, you leave out, why'd you leave out the one black song, Cam? <laughs> Uh, play game played by because I think I was just so excited like when it happened oh no I was I just you. like Tariq <laughs> <laughs> so play game is mostly song wrapped by Tariq Trotter as mm-hmm. H-A-W-K Hawk Smooth a street rapper and working actor but Tariq Trotter, who is this, you may ask? 
He may be like Anno if you're familiar with the fucking roots. <laughs> Like, Just like a fuck? minor little band, you may never have heard of them. Yeah. Um. So he's the lead MC and like a co-founder with Questlove of the. I thought Roots. he looked familiar. Yeah. Also, like known um, as Block Thought, um, who's like been in so many things uh like they're the roots are just it's just the roots like i don't know what else to say <laughs> i don't know um, what to tell you <laughs> but he also directed and wrote this short called choices uh that i did cool. watch before recording um that's why i had to push it back i wanted to like watch some more of the work and stuff pretty good yeah um yeah uh Tariq trotter is so cool <laughs> and this <laughs> song is so much fun because it's like you know in early 90s fun stylized like rap and r&b music video slash commercial (laughs) and i love how we get the comparison of him like actually performing like busking on the street and then andrew garfield as jonathan larson attempting to perform it uh, yeah, and, and so the, like Tariq was like crushing it, and then we get to Andrew Garfield doing it. And I was like, "Stop it, Andrew!" Um, Stop and then it. a really fun, like more musical. Knowledge. Stop it! Get some help. Yeah, we see uh, Tariq's character like in line, like auditioning, and he was like, "For Old Deuteronomy uh, from Cats." And I was just like, yeah. "I would like to see you with that role, please." Which okay, so I want to talk Wouldn't about you? that for like a quick second. I really love that they showed that. Uh, Because when Old Deuteronomy, it's like, it was, uh, the role was performed by Dame Judi Dench in the 2019 film version that we covered. Um, But in the, one of the main, at least, stage versions, um, it was played, I think also by a black man. I forget his name though. Uh, If you could look that up, it'd be fantastic. Um, But I, I really, I really appreciated that they included this moment of him auditioning for old deuteronomy uh because i think it's just like a little nod to the work that a lot of black artists were doing at that time Mm. and like how like what they were doing to make their way and like make it big in the theater world and i think like something that i think a lot of people might not know about especially with like the 90s like rap and hip-hop scene um that was like the era of sort of like the gangster rap um, type of style yeah. and a lot of rappers who rapped that style that was not them like a lot of gang- that's why you see a lot of rappers like queen latifah go from being like a quote-unquote gangster rapper to being like an actor and like doing things in the arts and like theater because that's what they actually wanted to do but they had to do the rap to yeah. get there get so the it's notoriety really cool that we- so that they can have the power and the influence to, to like actually, actually be able to go into the spheres that they want to work in. To be considered. Um, to be considered, yeah. Um, okay. So, so I thought, I thought those old, were cool that Old that. Deuteronomy was originated by, in the West End, Brian Blessed in 1981. But Broadway 1982, Ken Page. I think that's the name that I knew. Yeah. And yeah. then um, the character in the 2016 Broadway revival, uh, Quentin Earl Darrington. So. Yeah, but you were thinking of Ken Page. Yes, I was thinking Broadway. of Ken Page. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we, so we hear play game and then we get to... Wild it was Judy Ditch. <laughs> now that I think about it. Like... Yeah. <laughs> like, like, we did like, to... I love, I love Dave Oh, Judy I love Dave like... Judy We did, we did talk about this during Cats episode because I think we were just trying to get through the episode. But like, that's wild. Yeah, it's like, Ultimate Romney has always been played by a man, usually a black man. And then they just were like, Dave Judy Ditch <laughs> For no reason. <laughs> so funny. Um, so funny. Yeah. Um, so then we get to rehearsals. So we see um, he's in this like studio area. Um, he's got a piano, a pianist, um, and a group of various actors and vocalists who are going to be like rehearsing the piece to perform just in the studio, uh, like basically just perform the music for producers and backers that will be coming in in a week. Um, <laughs> okay, so I did feel attacked when he, with the pianist, like they were running through the song and he leans over to the pianist and says, make sure you're not speeding up. And I was just like, oh, yeah, I feel oh, attacked, yeah, sir. You should. The, the <laughs> rehearsal pianist, Francis, played by Kurt Crowley, who's been in the music department in, in The Heights, Hamilton, um, The Machine, and he also composed the theme music to The Machine. Oh, that's cool. <sighs> yeah, it's dope. Um, yeah, so this... Uh, we see basically a montage of them like starting to rehearse and then we see Susan come in um, and Susan is like, hey, 
it's it's well at this point it's Tuesday when she when she finally like comes in and talks to him. Um, but it's like, hey, it's uh it's Tuesday. They need an answer by Wednesday. You gonna you gonna do no. something about that? Yeah. While he's um, also like overwhelmed with he's like he needs like uh more musicians, um, but they oh, only have like right. twelve yeah. RSVPs, and so it's like a hundred dollars per musician. So he needs to like find a way like to make money elsewhere. Um, yeah, and it's like at this point he only has a pianist and a drummer, and he needs yeah, at least a synth as well, and ideally and a guitar. Also, really hard because like Freddie is like not doing as well. We do find out like three he went to attended three of his friends' funerals last year. Yeah. Uh, Dan Gordon Alley, uh, which like Ooh. I mean some of yes like in, I think that either the names or the people like inspired characters in Rent Gordon. Yes, yeah. So there were three characters in Rent that were named after them. Those were three individuals old, who were actual oldest. friends that Jonathan Larson lost, yeah. and he used Rent and Tick Tick Boom to kind of like uh, immortalize them a bit. Yeah, and the yeah. oldest of them were like twenty seven, and like Freddie yeah. is just way too young. But things are not going to is like he and he also like doesn't have time to talk to Michael. Like Michael's like calling him, and be like, hey, he is like you know, ob- like Michael's obviously not doing great. Yeah. And he just can't hear it right now, which is heartbreaking. Um, and so, yeah, with the Susan stuff, um, I'm just like, take the job. Yeah. Oh, but we do see um, Michael gets him into a focus group for his advertising company um, that he can use. Like, or it, It'll give him about $75, which is most of the money towards one new musician for yeah. his workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, like, he sells, like, a lot of his, like, records and stuff. Um, 50 for everything. Um, <laughs> the woman's like, oh, no, he's keeping the he's God spell. He's keeping the God spell. I don't know what that so, means. So, it, God spell is... <sighs> it's fine. We're fine. <laughs> We're good. We're at a good place in our friendship you still love relationship. Me. Of course. Of course I do. Um, those are your words. So, next... <laughs> um, yeah, Michael can really use his advice on things. Focus group, same five bucks, super nice. Yep. Um, and Caressa asks Jonathan, "Is like, hey, can I hear the hey, new song? Yeah, that song. Mm-hmm. Nope, you can't. So he's got, Jonathan's got a lot going on. Yeah, so he's like really struggling at home, and then Susan like calls him, and like on the answering machine is like, I know you're ignoring. I see all your lights on, and yeah. then he like looks up to the payphone, and she's like, I see you. And she comes up. Asshole. <laughs> and then they start arguing and that he's just being ignored. Uh, like, he's not cleaning. He's drinking too much. And Jonathan's like, oh, thanks for being supportive of what I'm trying to do. And Susan's just Which... like, you have literally never been. So- you are not supporting me with anything I want to do. Literally so. at all. Like, she didn't deserve that. So um, we get into the song Therapy. Therapy. Huh. What a okay. fun what song. What a fun song. So this song is all about what it feels like to like fight as a couple, but also you love your partner and like you're trying to you're trying yeah, to like, not be hurtful and you're trying to like I don't want to say the things that I'll regret and I know that there's a certain way that I need to communicate because that's what our therapist told us. Like I'm using the language that Dr. Warwitz told us to use in our communications and I'm trying to get through to you and explain how my reaction to your reaction to my reaction was not like it's just no. like so this passive aggressive it goes spoil. Back and forth between John and Caressa singing yeah. and John and Susan fighting so let's talk about them one at a time yes which one do you want to talk about first uh, i think i want to talk about the fight the scene the actual fight first because because of because the song mirrors it i think intentionally yeah so then like let's talk about that afterwards okay cool yeah okay so um apparent like man um in this relationship, Susan doesn't have the space to be able to talk about her needs. Yes. And that's bad. Um, she's been unhappy for months. And he's like, no, after the workshop, everything will be bad. Everything this has been a really hard workshop. like past week for me. And she was like, it's been a really hard like past few months for me. Yeah. In case you noticed or wanted to know. Or cared. Um, and she, she talks about how, like, you know, you see us as the artist and the girlfriend, like not 
either not realizing or not appreciating the fact that I am my own whole person yeah. with my own whole life that I would like to share with you, but it is not of you. Like my life is yeah. not inherently tied to you except as I choose to make it be. So yeah. like, I want to like, this is what I want for my dream and my career and my development. And if you love, and from her perspective, like if you loved me and you truly supported me, you would at least be willing to talk about it. No. Yeah. And like, yeah, she's not just the artist girlfriend. She is also yeah. an artist. She is her whole yes. self separate from him and it gets to the point where she was like um i wanted you to tell me not to go and he's like of course i don't want you to go and she's like really because this is the first you have time you never said, said that and so then they hug and yeah. then the most fucked up oh thing. my god he gosh. like is tapping rhythmically on her shoulder, on her shoulder. And, and she's, she's just like, like you motherfucker are you <laughs> writing a song right now about from this, this situation specifically which Ugh. And it's like, I, I don't know, from like, from the type of character that Jonathan is, because like, I've met, I've known people like that, that like, their brain is just constantly going, they're constantly making those connections and associations and like. My brain is like that. Yeah, and my, to an extent, mine is too, and like, I get it, but at the same time, like, there's a point where you have to, you have to decide what's important to you. And like, yes, obviously his dream of being a composer and a theater and a musical theater writer and all that stuff, like that is his dream. And he shouldn't necessarily give up on that and he should continue pursuing that. But at a certain point, if this relationship is important to you, then you need to make that clear. Yeah. And that's what he's failing to do. Yeah. So the song therapy, so super the song fun. Super is fun. It's super hilarious manic, and amazing. Slapstick. The Vanessa Hudgens' hair by the end, I love it. How her hair gets is like standing on end. <laughs> it's like very much. Oh, uh, what was the the? Uh, oh fuck! What was the ventriloquist? Ventriloquist? Uh, blah 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 blah. You know, what I'm trying to say puppet act. Um, with the guy in like the like the bowler hat and it's very much like you know what I'm talking about it's like theory, honestly what Andrew Garfield was like referencing with his face yeah what was it from i don't i think i know what you're talking about but i can't visualize it well enough to put a name to it <sighs> give me a second but yeah, so they have these, um, they have these like manic smiles on their faces, like, and you can tell it's the type of smile where like you're plastering a smile on your face because you don't want to get like you are angry, but you don't want to yell. Like you want to keep it civilized, you want to keep it cordial. So like it's like that like wide eyed crazy smile. Um, and like I love like the language of the song. Um, so it's it's all things like. Oh, like, I feel bad that you feel bad about, like, that thing you said about, like, me not being able to share my feelings. And, like, well, if you thought that what I thought and, like, that I wasn't sharing my thoughts, then my reaction to your reaction. Um, I don't know. I, I just think the lyrics are really cool. In yeah, that, and, and like, that circumvential, passive aggressive way. Yes. Okay. So I found this one article. Uh, Tick, tick, boom is a worthy follow up for Lin Manuel Miranda by Nora Goodell in November 16, 2021, on the Rye Record. Whatever. Um, Whatever. Larson, a fundamentalist to the theater, is his ideal role, and Garfield throws himself into the holy challenge, particularly in the film standout musical numbers. He hits the high notes with confidence and nails every dance move. Therapy, a ventriloquist inflicted number that chronicles an argument between Jonathan and his girlfriend. Um, so I just don't think it was maybe rest, like, they were being ventriloquist dummies. They are yes. being puppeteered by, like, the greatest situation was what I was trying to say. But I do think this is interesting because this article said maybe a blatant ripoff of they both reach for the gun from Chicago. That, strongly, that's what I was thinking about. Strongly disagree yes. with that statement. Oh, okay. Um I'm thinking just the Noah, stylism. Maybe not but, the content, but the stylism. Yeah, Chicago did invent being a ventriloquist, uh, but there are similarities. Um, yes. 
Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Ah, that's gonna be stuck in my head. That's one of my favorite songs from Chicago, so that's really fun. I'm gonna watch Chicago tonight. That'll be fun. Chicago's a great musical. You should. Um. So yeah, it's just so good. And Vanessa Hudgens is so good. Well, they both are so good in it. Yes. But it's when they're like, the song is so much fun because with the increasing tempos and like, and like there's frenetic like, energy. Yeah, yes. good way to put it. And then when they have like differing melodies, when one is uh, more like when they're singing rhythmic sort of like, and it's one's almost more like in canon. It's like rhythmic versus melodic. Yeah, oh, it's not canon. They're counter melodies. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When Vanessa Hudgens for the first time is more like that melodic part, and then she gets mm-hmm. into that like falsetto, like head voice, like kind of like yes. the. Uh, I I mean I was about to do it. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, but when she did, I was just like, "You're so gosh darn so talented, good. so good." And I love um I love well, like, their, I said their that body you should language. Drop dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I said you should drop dead. I still I still feel it. Though. Yeah, <laughs> body language. That's really important though because they yes. are stiff. And uncomfortable. Stiff as a board. But smiling. As a feather. Always. Ventriloquist. Eyes happy. <laughs> um, and I They're love puppets. how it ends. I love how it ends with, okay, well, it's four in the morning. We have our appointment with our therapist in the morning. And um, it's too late to screw. So I guess we should just go to bed. <laughs> Which is really funny because, like, implying that originally you thought they were in, a, like, a couple's you know, they were counseling in a therapy, therapy session. And they were like, nope, this is the it's tomorrow. This was, this was just for us. <laughs> Which, like, I think honestly makes more sense because what people, I think what a lot of people don't realize about what couple therapy at least is intended to be. So, like, a lot of people think of couples therapy as, like, oh, you go when you have an issue that you need to talk through. You should I mean, go yes, before you, you have should, an issue. But you should go before you have an issue because couple ther- couples therapy is meant to help you learn how to communicate with your partner. Because uh, even if you love each other and even if you theoretically like know each other and understand each other, there's still just ways that you're communicating that the other person may not understand. And so, like... And a lot of those moments, like a therapist would have stepped in and been like, oh, hey, I noticed you reacted this way. How did that make you feel? But this is the frenetic the night before. We got to get all of this out so that we can look presentable to our therapist in the morning. Look good. We, have, we have to win therapy. We and have this to win is like, therapy. <laughs> which honestly, it's like a really like good thing to do for like couples counseling, couples therapy. Yes. Because like we have a mutual friend, and I'll tell you the name later. I don't want to, you know, put him on That's what, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but before he got married... Um, him and his now wife went to like couples therapy for a while. My sister because, and her fiance are doing couples therapy currently. Oh, so great because yeah. uh, for uh, our friend, um, the examples of like married life, husband and wife for both those families weren't great. They recognize that, but yeah. sometimes just recognizing it is not enough. Is not so they're enough. like, let's put, let's, let's go to like counseling therapy so that the things that we do recognize, we don't like subconsciously or, you know, not intending to like recreate because that's not what we want for this. Mm-hmm. And it's super yeah. mature, healthy, emotionally intelligent, and I love it. So, yeah, John then fucked up. Um, yeah, and, so like, then at she the end of this song, she's like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, yeah. I can't. And she like, she's like, she's like taking a job. Um, yeah. And what I assumed at the end of this song was that they've broken up. Correct, which apparently which is not apparently, what Jonathan assumed. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. i glad I wasn't alone in that. Because I very much thought, because when she said, I can't do this anymore, and walked out of the room, I think, yeah, that's the universal signal for, like, this is over. Um, yeah. Jonathan Isn't apparently it? did not get Isn't that message. <laughs> um, so we get to the focus group. So funny. So the focus group, um, oh, man. Okay. It's been tested on a number of mammals. <laughs> The, okay, so the the head of it, Laura Benanti, um, playing Judy, um, she, oh my god, like the people that they get got to do this movie is just so much fun. So, um, she's been in The Detour, Supergirl, Worth. Um, she got a in two thousand eight. She got a Tony uh, for her role as Gypsy Rose Lee in Gypsy. Oh, that's cool. Um, you know, with Patty Lapone. Uh, mm-hmm. She's been in Nine, The Wedding Singer. She's also been in, like, Meteor Shower. She's been in so many things. Yeah. Million um, things. Incredible. She is so funny in this. And then we have Danielle uh, Furland as Kim, Michaela Diamond as Peggy, and 
Utkarsh and Budakar as Todd. And so many times I said, fuck you, Kim. <laughs> you know? She was a bitch. This, and like, for a split second, like, they're trying to, like, you know, conjure up imagery about America. It seems like for the first time, Jonathan Larson is getting, like, paid and like financially supported rewarded and acknowledgement of Mm -hmm. his incredible creativity yes so he's really good at they're like keep going they get when he like fully like goes into it and is describing what this product could be yeah yes so what does it's like okay great this is great that's going on the board keep talking so now details about what we're actually trying to sell it is raven (laughs) It is a tasteless, odorless chemical compound that will be used as a fat substitute in food. It has been tested on a number of mammals. Um, some side effects do include toxic shock syndrome. Um, also, uh, among many other things, full hair coma loss. and death. <laughs> uh, full hair loss. Uh, skin scales. <laughs> skin scales. I forgot about that. Also, also, what was uh, what was the other one? Oh, yeah. Um, Re- apparently, it yeah, it resulted in some reactions that may have uh, resulted in brief hospitalization. Yeah, just brief. It's fine. Um, just and so very brief, after minor. he's like feeling really good, he's like, maybe this could be my life. Then we get like some more like you know like broken carousel, like demented like circus music when he's just like hearing everything's going on. Mm-hmm. That this Which- is his hell. This is fully what the, like, bait and switch of corporate slash, like, industry, industrial America feels like. Because you get there and they're just like, hey, you've got this great new job. You're going to have a 401k. You work here long enough, you're going to have a pension. and You're going to have benefits and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, but also we're going to, like, slowly and deterioratingly... That's not a word. Okay, um, no, no. What are you suck trying your to say? soul out. <laughs> We're going to. Uh, I like yeah, that's, degeneratively. That's I, why are you trying to adverb it? Their I soul will deteriorate. Deteriorate. Sure, I don't do words good. That's not true. <laughs> Objectively false. You dumb idiot. <laughs> it's so rude. It's really fun to call someone a dumb idiot, though. It is fun. I I understand that. I get that. Um, So then Jonathan suggests the name Chubstitute, which I think is a master. I thought it was a I thought it was a great name, but it was super rude. He wasn't taking seriously, and his best friend like got him this opportunity. Like, like, yeah, because they they pay you to be a part of these focus groups. Like, it's it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, and, like, really, like, put his neck out on the line. Yeah, because they use these to generate, like, actual consumer data that they will use to, like, market the item. So now but, like, also, Michael. it's a tasteless, odorless chemical compound that's going in food that's a fat substitute that's been tested, quote, on a number of mammals. So, like... Yeah. Mm. Come on. So now he's <laughs> fighting with Michael, and he's just like, no, you, like, gave up. He was like, you wanted to do these all these things. Like, you're, like, having this stupid job that you're selling lives and poison to people what's yeah. stopping you from doing what you want to do and then reality check motherfucker Vibe check. <laughs> michael's <laughs> like oh what's stopping me i can't have kids i can't get married because i can't I'm live as fucking... a normal fucking person in this country because it is the fucking 90s and i'm gay like mm-hmm. what the fuck do you think and jonathan's just like recedes to into himself because this is also where senator jesse helms comes back so we previously saw him on the newscast and now um michael mentions him by name so senator senator jesse helms um for anyone who's not aware like we kind of talked earlier but he was sort of leading the charge against um the lgbt community especially um during the aids epidemic and like talking about like yeah if you if, if you just weren't gay you wouldn't be dying um so yeah and i i think like and this is where I talked a little bit about how, or for me, like part of the scene, um, partly to me leans into a little bit of how this movie is like the greatest showman, but done better in the sense of like, in the greatest showman, we talked about how the story itself is like following 
a you know white male, which is fine, like nothing wrong with that. Um, but they included Disagree. a lot of other characters of like marginalized identities without actually talking about their story or their perspective. And while there's definitely, I mean, there's always more that can be done to you know, make sure that everyone is, is included equitably. But this movie definitely does a better job of actually talking about like, hey, yeah, there's all these different people and all these different types of characters that are in the story that are a part of this world. Let's actually talk about the issues that are affecting them. And in this in, yeah. in this time period, the issues that are affecting them is are largely the AIDS epidemic on top of other things, like just yeah. general institutional homophobia and racism. Okay, then we see... Rosa called back. Got Rosa every did pro- call back. Got She's every got every producer, producer in town. In town. Um, which is like great, but also terrible because he and still has to also song. motivates him because, Raven, when you have a deadline that you've put off for a while, you tried your hardest, and you like finally have the motivation to do it, what do you do first? Anything but that. Anything but that. <laughs> Clean your entire apartment. It was Clean like the most relatable apartment. thing. <laughs> I'm like, I swear to God, this musical, I was just but like... But it's also like, it's one of those things for like... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're fine. I was going to say, it's one of those things for like... I, I I really get it in the sense of like... I feel like a lot of people, especially that don't have ADHD or don't experience similar levels of like anxiety and depression and stuff, um, will look at this and be like, oh, you're just still procrastinating writing the song. But it's like... What, but what in do you a mean way, just do it? But in a way, I'm not he, Nike. Also, he also has to clean his apartment to be able to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know that feeling where it's like, I know I need yep. to do this work, but you, I like, physically you need to can't yes. until yes. my apartment is like, clean. Yeah. Raven, I know. I know. I know. Well, okay. The listeners. <laughs> this ain't about them. Um, so he, like, does all that. Cameron, don't like, give a fuck about y'all. Finally ready to do something. Electricity's caught off. Uh, he like calls the like power people and they're like we sent you so many notices he's like no you're supposed to call first blah 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 and then he calls susan her roommate beth answers like yeah. susan there at first i thought susan he was gonna ask, talk to you at first i thought he was gonna ask can i come over there and use your power which i was that's what i thought he was gonna ask too which did. i think he would have if he'd gotten on the phone with her yeah um yeah. but beth is like uh yeah. i'll tell her you called um yeah and then he hasn't written a single note or lyric for the most important song of his in the entire life. play so what does he do when he doesn't know what else to do he goes swimming. he goes swimming so we, and get, so to the song, we get to the pool and we get to the swimming. song swimming spoiler which okay so this is another song similar to no more where like he kind of contrasts um the like heavy rock with the sort of lilting ballad type song. Um, and it's really, really cool because here, so we see that... I love this the, song. It was the so well done. Rock, yeah, the rock portion of this song is mirroring the like frenetic energy that he's feeling of like all this anxiety of like, I have to finish this song, but like there's all these things working against me. There's all these things I need to consider. Like my, uh, like my, I need to call my best friend. My girlfriend isn't talking to me. Like all these other things. Um, and it kind of like crescendos and crescendos and crescendos and then it peaks and he's underwater um and i think the visual with the, that what, but also with that added undercurrent no pun intended with the he is physically swimming so he needs to be paying attention to that to so he's, breathing he's grounded and like, to like he's counting like one two, two three, three four yes. kick turn which is helping to drive (laughs) like you know you know what i'm saying Um, yes we're just helping to drive the rhythm and i think it's anticipate 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 pain like he is like the swimming is grounding like he has a lot going in his head but like the the act of swimming and what he has to pay attention to is like grounding his thoughts yes it's grounding what he needs to get through and is able it's making it so he's able to make sense of the static in his head. Which this is also why this is a real thing where like if you're this is why I draw. like going yeah, if your mind is going like a million miles an hour, doing something physical that like your yes. body can execute. Let's um especially get physical. without a significant amount of physical. thought. 
um, while you're trying to think through something is actually a really, really good way of sorting out your thoughts. Like for me, I like to go on a walk, mostly because I have a dog, so I have to walk him all the time anyway. Um, but like, that's also why people pace when they're like thinking a lot or like talking out loud or something like that, because like it yeah, occupies your body me. and it physically grounds you to, to a physical sensation while your brain is working. Listeners, if this is like something that like you have a problem with, but you don't have the time to like go on the walk, don't like get out yeah. a sketchbook or anything like that. Something I suggest is if you, it's like very inexpensive, if you're able to get like origami paper and like when you feel mm. like that, just make one thing, just make something. Yeah. That, that's or like something that, that like my therapist, we were, like, we were trying to like work what kind of tangible physical activity that I can do still in my space that I like am allowed with like what I have going on, but I can like ground myself. Because yeah. especially a lot of people, what they do, they go to, like, social media, their phone, TikTok, and, like, try to lose themselves in that, which does work for some people, but, like... Depending on the nature of your feed, of your timeline... A, a lot be... of the same people usually also lose themselves in that, so you just need, yes. like, a like like a strict boundary start-finish, and I think yeah. uh, doing origami is a great strategy to mm -hmm. sort through all that. My recommendation. Also, something similar, if you're already into it, like um, physical puzzles, like things like Rubik's Cubes or like 3D puzzles can also be really good for that. Anything that your body can like physically interact with. Yeah. Um, or yeah, have really... sex. Uh, fucking's always good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Talk so we folding. see. And I also, I also think it's really cool the juxtaposition or, or like the visual imagery i'm using so many rhetorical devices today oh man um, you're so figurative <laughs> the the visual imagery of like that heavy rock and like crescendoing is while he's actively swimming so it's like yeah. you see the choppiness of the water and like his arms like moving through the water and like all that stuff the music then, is mimicking the physical environment yes and so then when he sinks below the surface and we see it we hear it peak and uh transition into come to your senses the come to your senses like part of it where he actually sees the like the composition the, 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 yeah and the like musical in staff. the tiles of the pool which is so cool and, and then I when think... it like zooms out and you just see like you know the sheet music that like from the pool yes. i was just like this is fun this is fun funky fresh <laughs> and I, I i think like this is what i was talking about when i was talking about like honoring the original form of the stage musical but understanding how film as a medium can be used to tell the story because this is something that like this so this well effect done. is not physically possible in a stage musical it's only possible in film and the fact that Lin-Manuel Miranda like he's a composer who's worked a lot with stage like he did he did Hamilton you know what I mean who's worked a lot with stage theater <gasps> but he's also worked a lot in like film and I think I like we've seen Moana. musicals We've seen musicals uh, like Les Mis and Cats was a film director adapting a stage musical when he didn't have experience in stage theater or musical theater. And then the producers was a theater director directing a film when they didn't have experience in film. But like now we have someone who has experience in both worlds, like bringing the two together. And it's beautiful. And to oh, me, no. this scene is like showing the culmination. of And that. then we have the Muppet movie. <laughs> Which is perfection have in every way. Tenacious D and the Pick of Destiny. And then we have the last fifth category, which is just from Justin and Kelly. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, and then the last thing I'll say about swimming mm -hmm. is that it's just so cool. He's like composing as he's swimming. But it yes. just the the effects like to me were very across the universe. Um Yeah. And I don't know. I just thought that was really cool. Um Shout out to my boyfriend who mentioned that. Um, oh. Let's see if he listens. He's a big <laughs> fan. Um, so it now it's the next day. Like, well, I guess technically the same day. I assume he stayed up all night. It's um, yeah, it's the same day. That's very much <laughs> just like, that I got. Like, I was like, <laughs> me projecting myself into this. This is why I think this, and I think I'm correct. Because when his right before when he was saying that he was going to go to the pool. He was like, I have my thing, like the workshop or whatever, in 12 hours, and all I can think about is going swimming. We find out the next morning that the workshop was starting at 10 in the morning, which yeah. means at the earliest, it was 9 p.m. when he made the decision to go to the pool. And then he wrote an entire song. So I can only assume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, so the room is empty, and he's freaking the fuck out. And then Cressa the comes out. out, and he's just like, hey, are you good? And he's just like, just like no, no one's, one's here. here. And he, she was like, yeah, because it's like over an hour before we start. And he's just like, oh, <laughs> thank wrong God. With you? <gasps> like, oh, my God. Okay? Again, Vanessa Hudgens' characters grounds everyone. Grounding um, people. And it's just so funny. And then this is when he was just like, oh, by the way, can you sight read? I have your song. Today's the day. Um, which, honestly, good for Caressa for coming in early. Honestly. Honestly. What a professional. What a professional. What a professional. Like, an hour early, too. Because I was also just like, you're only going to give her an hour to learn this entirely new song on top of preparing for the song she already knows? Wild. But yeah. she is amazing, so she can do it. So um, people start coming in. We, we yeah. see his parents. Um, mm-hmm. His father, Al. Uh, Alan Larson, played by Danny Burstein. Um, he's been an evil efforts for family on Broadway. He was in, uh, the boy from Syracuse. Um, Dewberry was a lady company. And then his mom, Raven, I'm glad you're sitting down. His mom, Nan, Nanette Larson, mm-hmm. played by Judy Kuhn, mm-hmm. who is the oh, singing. Oh, wait, <gasps> wait, Judy Kuhn? Singing voice for <gasps> Pocahontas. That's his mom in this. What the fuck? What the fuck? Law and That's Order. Crazy. She was also Enchanted. She's an actor and composer. It's Judy fucking Kuhn. Like it's Judy Kuhn. Oh my god, she has a beautiful voice. And like that's his mom in this. And I was just like, I want to hear you sing though. <laughs> and I want you to sing. Can you sing a song in this? That would nope. be great. I can't. Unfortunately, um, no. So like more people are coming. Um, mostly he was like, oh, mostly friends. Like Michael comes, they like hug and then he's just like, yeah. you're going to kill it. It's fine. Like, we're fine. Yeah. We're good. We're good. Um, oh, also his parents just like, oh, are they paying you? And he's like, no, nah. I'm paying for this. And he's like, okay, super parent. Like they sit down. And it's like, also his hair. What is he doing? <laughs> what um, is he doing? <laughs> and then, um, his manager comes, um, and it's just like, Rosa's like, don't worry. This is like having a colonoscopy in Times Square, except the, worst, the that worst that can happen with that. The worst thing that can happen with colonoscopy is that you turn out to have cancer. The which worst is that can not a, a great comparison. Nope. Not in the slightest. Um, but the worst thing that happens with the musical is that you find out you're already dead. And I'm just like, I get what she's going for, but I feel like they're not the same. Nope. <laughs> um, and then, like, finally, it's been 15 minutes, like, over, like, like 10, 15, quarter yeah. past. Um, as some would say, which and I actually, I actually say that when I'm telling time, yeah, get I know. Mad at me. I know. <laughs> We're moving on, and <laughs> it's like he's like he has to get started, and then who walks in? Stephen fucking Sondheim, portrayed by Bradley Whitford. Oh, man, and like, like I like did have a sense of relief, and then I was wondering right? if Susan was going to be there. Yeah, I, th- I think Susan was who he was actually waiting for. Uh, but he also did want Steven to be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steven, look at me. <laughs> I'm not cool enough to call and him Steven. And then he was like, the next one and a half hours is a blur. And then we get to Caressa's new song, Come to Your Senses. He doesn't see Come Caressa there. Senses. He sees Susan. He sees Susan. And we start the song with her singing to him on that rooftop um, where she first told him about the job. And... I think I think it's important that it's there and not yeah. inside his apartment, um, because come to your senses. Yeah, like act like the she's, fuck up, dude. Yeah, and like I know because we've seen her sing before. Like I know he loves me. He just doesn't know how to show it really. Um, and this is kind of like coming back to that. And I really love that the lyric, that the line ends with come back alive, not necessarily come back to me because it's yeah. not, because again, like she is her whole own person independent of you. Um, she would like to be with you, but like her life doesn't depend on you, dude. Um, and yours shouldn't depend on her, but it's a, uh, you need to figure your shit out before any of this can work. Yeah. Yeah. And also, f- some of these fucking lyrics, defenses are not the way to go. Speak for yourself. Uh, like, go fuck yourself. Uh, and then, then there's the line, um, and you, uh, I'm paraphrasing slightly because I don't remember the exact words, but like, you used to know, or what is it? Come to your senses, defenses are not the way to go, um, and you know that, or at least you knew. 
Yeah. I love that also, line. Also, during this, I was like saying, I was like, wouldn't it be so great if they started harmonizing? Because it goes back and forth Ugh. between Susan and Caressa. And, and Caressa. literally, Raven, As literally the it. next beat, they start harmonizing. Incredible. This song is so good for both of them. So good. In like very different ways because they have very different like tones to their voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's just like so cool to hear them meld together. Yeah. It's like a, um, like an additive effect. It's like a, mm-hmm. it's like a, the singing version of factorials. <laughs> the fact that I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, this song is so good. Um, it's just so incredible. And then he's like at his apartment, he's like calling Rosa and Rosa like called and like after here, I left six messages and he's just like, okay, so like how'd it go? And he was like, everyone loved it. It was a hit. And he's like, okay, so what's next? Rosa says, can't wait to see what, what you they do say, next. what you'll do next. Um, they thought it was too artsy for Broadway, too expensive for off Broadway. Yeah. Um, and then this well, is when also she gets Superbia was set in the in the, like a post apocalyptic yeah. like future, so yeah. it was like this like super techno like future and everything. Like it was going to be. It was kind of like way a out mirror there. to like uh, Orson Welles. Uh, was it Orson Welles? Nineteen eighty four. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of like a mirror. Or that to was something that, else right. that he wrote, but I think this was meant to be the the mirror to I... to nineteen. Yeah, because he tried to get the rights to nineteen eighty four yes. to write yes. a direct yes. musical adaptation of it, and they wouldn't let him. So and that's so why he transformed he made it to this. Superbia. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, but... so definitely something that would have been very aspirational especially in the 90s and then yeah. rosa says to him okay kid honest this is what you do you start writing the next one and if that doesn't work out you start writing the next one because this is what it is to be a writer yeah so and like rosa is like you, you know you're a writer so you need to write that it was like what's next you write the next one you write um, yeah and she was like honestly takes him off speakerphone it's like honestly you're talented for this next one, write what you know. Yeah. And people. Because you obviously have uh, a powerful ability to write. So just write what you know and it'll be amazing and everyone will want to do it. Which yeah. is what And happens, it's just like, so. and which is great advice. And then he's like super distraught. He goes to Michael and he was like, hey, I need a job. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't. Yeah. I spent so much time. I can't deal with this rejection. Nothing's coming from this. Fuck this. I, I can't do it. And then um, Michael's like, is telling him, it's like, no, no, no. I was a mediocre actor. There's only one Jonathan Larson. And he's trying to argue with him. He's like, I'm HIV positive. Yeah. If I'm lucky, I might have a year. And then. Um, yeah, because at this time, um, being HIV positive, and especially an AIDS diagnosis, was a death sentence. Yeah. And so then yeah. Jonathan says, which is the most heartbreaking part of the movie. He's like, why don't you tell me? You tried. You tried. When he called him earlier. Um, and directly asked him, like, hey, I need your advice on some things. Can we, like, yeah. can you come over and we can talk yeah. and blah, blah, blah. So they, like, talk and stuff. And then, like, uh, like Jonathan leaves. He's just, like, walking about. He's aimless. Um, and we learned that he, like, met Michael at 8 at sleepaway camp. Um, and then we get to the song Real Life. And right. they, like, talk about their dreams. They're, like, lifelong best friends. Um, like, thinking back to, like, important memories and stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. And during this, like, Young John's played by Charles Comforty, Young Michael's played by Derek Delgado, Teenage John's played by Mason Versaw, and Teenage Michael's playing by Javier Sayas. So, um, this song hurts. (laughs) Yes, and it's it's such an emotional delivery by, um, what is his first name, Robin DeJesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, it's such an emotional delivery, um, and I think it's interesting that the actual song portion of it is only four words. Is this, oh, also, like, it's only four I apologize. I, I said who voiced, um, who acted as the young and teenager Michael Which was during Jonathan. the next song. But it's, it was yeah, during it's Why. Yeah, just yeah. to clarify. I caught myself. Yeah, yeah. I've been drinking. Yeah, you're good. It's fine. I know. Um, I'm great. <laughs> feeling good, feeling um, great. But blah, it, blah, it blah, reminds blah. me, to me, this song is the one that's sort of similar in theme to um ah, shoot the like session the support group in rent that scene 
Raven Jewel. In the sense that, like, crying. that was also that was also like the same two lines really that were being sung in canon or like four lines or whatever that were being sung in canon this is really just one four word line that is being repeated over and over but like growing in intensity and meaning and sort of like the meaning of is this real life changes sort of as the song (laughs) changes as the song sort of goes on um life support and it's kind of life support yes um and it's sort of I don't know, I feel like it sort of takes on this meaning of, like, really, like, I, I think the fact that this song leads into why, um, and then later into Louder Than Words, is really about, like, actually stopping to take a look at what's happening around you. Because this is the first time, like, Jonathan has experienced um, the loss of other friends as a result of yeah. AIDS um, so far in the story. And, like, he almost lost Freddie. Um, but now, like, Michael is his best friend. Like, known each other since they were children, basically brothers, ride or die. And, like, so... I was about to say him, ride or die. Didn't that make me sad <laughs> thinking about it? Yeah. Um, and so the fact that he now is dying, um, I think, is sort of that wake-up call. And, like, this has come right after come to your senses and so it's like that um and i think if you think about all the songs like right next to each other like come to your senses then real life then why and then louder than words it's all building to this like to this statement or to this voice to jonathan like this is what you need to be dedicating your life to yes and something that we really didn't talk about um was like throughout this musical um when Jonathan sees something interested or inspired by, he'll write in his notebook. Yeah. Like a sentence, like a note. Like, remember this. And it's coming together things like what's like his environment, what's going on in the world. He's like, sees this poster. And he's just like, why do, like, why do things have to uh, become a disaster for us to care or whatever? Like, stuff like yeah. that. Um, and this is like adding along with that. But that's what's been happening like throughout. The movie throughout so the movie well. and we see that um well we'll, we'll get to that when we yeah. get to louder and just uh um, it's just tough and so it yeah, starts it's raining really hard the ticking in his head is so loud that he described at the very beginning that he just hears mm-hmm. this cartoonish like tick tick boom um he just wants it to stop he like finds he finds like this i, I assumed it was in central park um mm-hmm. like the the stage uh, with like the piano yeah i assumed that's yeah. um and then we get to the song why which is and the interesting thing about this song, he actually doesn't say the word why ever during I mean, the song. He he doesn't say why, like W-H-Y, why? but he yes. says why in other ways. Like why? A- exactly, in exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it is the it is the sound that connects the different stories that he's expressing. Yeah, and also, like, I think, because in when we get to Louder Than Words, that's full of whys. It's full of the different questions he's been asking himself throughout um, throughout this musical. Um, and I think this song, Why, um, like, is sort of an answer to that. Yeah. And, yeah. like, just, like, some more, like, when I heard this song, it was just like, oh, no, it's a really interesting song made me like feel a lot of things so i just like wrote down like a list of words that i was just thinking when i was listening to it here are the words uh music box rhythmic constant pushing do something with that please (laughs) you want me to do something with that sure this is a partnership support me i thought it was a fun exercise right for like four like words that like no i think i think I think that makes sense and Good, okay I didn't so again know again putting that. our putting our music theory analysis hats on and granted i have not actually analyzed this music because i'm not a music theory student um so this is just an off-the-cuff theory Ooh. um but so again i've been watching a lot of like musical analysis video essays and, like they're really we cool. get it you're better than other people i am um but one of the things that a lot of um music analysis essayists will talk about is like the importance of like, or the significance of a descending or ascending baseline. 
And so when we talked about in 3090, when we talked about how like that song feels like it's pushing you and like yeah. driving you towards something, a lot of that is because of the rhythm. But I think it's also because that the bass line is like sort of going up. Like a um, solid in like, boogie In smaller woogie? increments. In smaller increments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> solid boogie woogie. Yes. I mean, I like, I know how that sounds comical. No, but I meant that with my entire heart. Like, it, with, like I was with being your whole chest? You said it with your whole chest? <laughs> I was com- being completely sincere when I said, <laughs> like a boogie woogie. Which... But honestly... Um, that's why I and... said it, Raven. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> and with this one like there's definitely a sense of that change and progression because we talk in 3090 like how that opening phrase like changes every time and is and only repeats for the first time when the beat drops Mm. um this one is sort of very similar (laughs) when you get to the sondheim fashion (laughs) (laughs) when you get to consistency be damned (laughs) When you get to the the parts of the song where he's saying over and over and over till we get it right. Um, So that bit. I was going to say chef's kiss, but then I forgot Jessica, one of our guests on a couple episodes. She tried to say that once, but instead said fingers kiss. And I like that more. (laughs) So I was about to say fingers kiss, but I I, I thought I needed to clarify beforehand. You did need a clarification for that. Thank okay, you. but from now on when I want to do chef's kiss, I'm going to say fingers, fingers kiss. kiss. So like, get Amazing. used to it listeners. Fingers <laughs> kiss. <laughs> because that's um, what it is. I'm no chef. True. Uh, but during that bit, so that... You mean true? I'm refra- a great cook. You are. Uh, but the refrain that he's playing does change every time when he's singing over and over and over. Um, and mm-hmm. then... And then he goes to like the sort of like discordant harmony, and then it resolves into like James the actual satisfying, <laughs> <laughs> and it resolves into the actual like satisfying chord or harmony. I don't yeah. know the names of those chords and harmonies because the, the, I'm the, not an actual musician. But... Would that be like the chord like resolves itself? Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I don't know what the chord is to like oh, yeah. say. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh. if you go look at We're other just drunk. Scientist. Musical analysis <laughs> video essayists on YouTube like Mateo and Wait in the Wings, they will tell you what those chords are because they're better at this than I am. So, nice. And also, so um, this song, yeah. he's really going through like his life with Michael. Uh, we see that when they're younger at the YMCA, uh, they would practice like at this talent show, Yellowbird, Let's Go Fly a Kite, Mary Poppins, Super Great. And like the phrase three o'clock sun really did something to me. Oh, yeah. When you were a kid and you're just... Uh, um, what a way Just to spend the day. Life. They're 16. They both got parts in West Side. Mike played Doc, the non-singing role. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Um, and then when they're finished, they saw like nine o'clock stars. Um, now they're 29. Michael and I, um... And just, like, really, like, come to your senses in a general sense, like, for the character. And this is the part I was just like, how incredible is Andrew Garfield? Yeah. Like, truly. How incredible is he? Um, what a way to spend the day. And so he, like, goes back to, like, Michael. And suddenly he's already researched, like, support groups, like, friends and deeds. Um, and, like, trying to figure out, it's like, this, we are together. We're, we are each other's lives. Yeah. Like, I, I, I finally, like, are hearing you and seeing you maybe, like, could have happened earlier, of course, but, like, I'm here now. Yeah. Then we get to Sunday. It's Jonathan Larson's 30th birthday. And, I mean, answer the damn phone. <laughs> like, has that not been, like, the moral of this story? Like, answer the phone when it calls? Honestly, answer the phone. <laughs> Okay, and this is really cool and made me cry when, like, it goes to the answering machine and it's like, oh, Stephen Sondheim, like, left a message. That voice but is what Stephen his message Sondheim. Is... No, no, no. That voice <gasps> Wait, was really? Stephen Sondheim. Yeah, that, that was Stephen Sondheim. Oh, my Sondheim. gosh. That was like, I didn't know that. Yeah, like, it's, like, a really upsetting. <laughs> um, like, he was Stephen Sondheim, Sondheim as himself was the voice for the voice recording for this Oh, that's movie. so cool that they did that. Isn't that, like, really hard? <laughs> cheers, Raven. I am Oh, cheers. Up. Cheers. Ooh, man. Oh my gosh. This movie fucked me up in every emotion. That's just amazing. Oh, and Stephen Sondheim's like, I hope it was okay. 
that like I got your number is like shut shut up. You're like, Stephen Sondheim. It's like <laughs> shut up. Um, yeah, and then I wrote down, started crying again. Campbell, I, myself, the royal y'all. Please refer me to ass. Um, please refer then, me to ass. <laughs> yes, and then we get to the diner, um, and then we hear from Carolyn. Freddie should be coming home soon. Yes. He's doing better, which is good to hear. And then Carolyn says the most relatable thing. When you have a friend who's going through relationship troubles and someone shows up because Susan is, like, outside, Carolyn says, you go handle that. <laughs> Facts. Like, I'm not touching it. What a, You go. What a perfectly <laughs> delivered line. Honestly. Because that's the exact and, feeling of just, like, you, you go deal with that. <laughs> But um, they have a very nice parting. I think that was a very mature. Yes. Uh, yeah. She like asked like how to like how it went, and he said no one picked it up. So he was very like bearing the lead. He didn't say like fucking Stephen Sondheim called him. Yeah. But he was and telling like, the truth technically. But she. Um, yeah. And then was, like she was I, like, I, was I wanted nice to be how, there. Yeah. How she like, was like, I, I wanted know. to be there. I thought that was sweet because she she was really hurt by what he had like said and done and just how he generally chose to like move through life. Yeah. Um, so I thought, but I, that I thought doesn't really, mean she didn't still love him. Doesn't mean she doesn't still love him. Doesn't mean she doesn't still support him or want the best for him mm-hmm. in his career. And so yeah. she was like, "What's next?" She was like, "I'm gonna start on the next one." She was like, "Good, honestly, you should." And she was like, "I yeah. decided to take that job." And I was like, "I thought that was already decided." And he's like, thought, "Yeah, that was well decided." Yeah, I was like, "Of course you did." Um, yeah. And then she, like, gives him a gift. And from 3090, they were, like, looking at, like, different things. And he sees this kind of, like, book for that you can, like, like <laughs> composition book, but, like, for composing. Um, mm-hmm. That was, like, out of his price range. And, like, she got him that for his birthday, even that though they really were cool. definitively broken up at that definitively point. Definitively over, yeah. Um, but and to she me, was, it's just, like... It fucked me up. Yeah. What a good gift. You know how a good gift fucks me up. You you love a good gift. Um, but then it's like then it's like goodbye, Jonathan. Um yeah. and like oh no. I like was upset he wasn't like sharing more with her and be like, Oh no, like this is like this isn't the end, like I here's all the great stuff's happening. But I think it was a healthy way to handle the situation. Yeah, and I also thought of it as like not that there was um not that he quote unquote shouldn't have told her, but that like that wasn't the point of that interaction. Like he didn't need to use that to tell her, like, oh, by the way, Stephen Sondheim loved my musical. You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. he wouldn't have said he's like, Oh, how'd it go? He's just like, No one picked it up, but like I have talked with Stephen Sondheim about it. He did like it. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> like <laughs> spitball in here. Um <laughs> But then she uh, and, then we, and then we, we see do... the next musical then is tick tick boom full circle that's like yes. what we've been seeing the entire time and we we get to we come back to that stage and we see that this is that same thing that we just saw like this is the workshop where they're bringing in yeah. the producers and the backers and like all that stuff mm-hmm. um and so we hear the song louder than words Oh, I was going to say, before that, they do have that, like, little bit about, like, the, like, you know, the rest of Jonathan. Oh, the rest of his, yeah. That, like, after Tick, Tick, Boom, it was Rent. It was on Broadway for 12 years, but, like, he never saw it. He had, like, aneurysm, like, before the... Actually not, but I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, interesting. During the composer's Uh, yeah. Before the first... He died. It was it was the night of, of the Rent's first, first premiere production or first preview production uh, off Broadway. Off Broadway of Rent. So like the first yes. like public show. Yes. So he of... never actually got to see it publicly performed. Yeah. Which is which, tragic. It's it hurts. <laughs> it yeah. like really does. Um, and then we get to louder than words. But like, why do we play with fire? I. These questions that this they're asking, song... Jonathan Larson, um, so Andrew Garfield, um, and then like uh, Roger and Caressa, Vanessa Hudgens, and Joshua Henry. Yeah. Like every question they ask, I was like, shut up. Oh, I don't want to think like, about why, this. But like, why though? I was like, why and are you like, putting me on blast like this? The line, the one that gets me, 
um, why do we stay with lovers who we know Shut deep up, down self. just aren't right? And I was just Shut like, up. oh, fuck. You really called me what out, What do we didn't put you? ourselves through? <laughs> uh, why do we put ourselves through pain uh, so we don't sleep alone at night? Like, what the yep. fuck is this? But it's like, but I was... Um, I was Cages reading... or wings, ask the birds. Oh, my God. Cages or wings, which do you prefer? Ask the birds. I, that lot, like, I love that so much. Just, like, the Stop depth trying of to that. Me, stop trying to make me live my life and be happier and, like, <laughs> as, like, put in the harder work to, like, enjoy, like, you know, the human experience. Stop trying but to relate again, everything to the human condition. I, I, but, shut up. <laughs> shut up. But, but again, I think this goes back to the song Why, because in that song, it's all about the relationship and the life that he's built with Michael and the bond that he has with him. And I think that, Shut like, I was watching something, um, probably a video essay, but I was watching something that was talking about how Jonathan Larson would, Love like, your video ask. Essays. I really do. Um, how he was talking about how, like, he would ask questions like questions like why do we play with flames like stuff like that um and then we like write music or write a musical to like answer why do the birds question suddenly appear every time you run near raven gross um <laughs> but yeah I, I think if we go back to the song why where like he doesn't actually say the say the word why um Young like man. that song is talking all about like his relationship with Michael and like what that means to him and how it shaped his entire life and like how he's going to effectively continue living his life for Michael. And I think that goes back to this song, Louder Than Words, of like action speaks louder than words. Like it's not enough to say that you like if 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 he loves his friend Michael and his friend is being deeply detrimentally affected by um this epidemic that no one is paying attention to, like, it's not enough to just say, like, oh, I, I care about you and I love you and, like, all this other stuff. It's, like, you need to do something about it. And we actually saw, um, I think it was during the either Real Life or Why compilation, we actually saw a scene where Michael was at a clinic. I assume when he was getting, it was like a flashback to when he was getting tested yeah, or like getting treatment yeah. or something like that. And we saw a poster behind him uh, from the, HIV, I, I think that was the real HIV life. AIDS epidemic. Yeah. In real life that literally said, it's not enough to think about HIV. Like you have to do something about it. Yeah. And that's what this song is getting at. It's a, like, it's not enough for us to say that we, care about each other and that we love each other and that we love all these people in our lives like we have to do like we have to actually take action to protect them and to make sure that that everyone is is living the life that they deserve basically yeah, yeah. and this song like in louder than words we see that like like super smash brothers ultimate everybody is here um which was yeah. uh, that, that was the slogan <laughs> Did you for, like make the that? <laughs> Um, I realized that you may not oh like God. get what that meant, but like that. I don't play was. Smash like that, but I know what you're talking about. Uh, yes. Everybody's here, and then you see like the the reserve seat for Susan, and you didn't see it, but you do see her standing in the back, which yes. made me feel so good. Um, and we saw Stephen Sondheim there. We saw Michael there. We saw Rosa there. Also, um, we know literally everyone. Um, yeah. And at the very end of Tick Tick Boom, we see him like playing Happy Birthday for himself. Um, but he doesn't fucking finish the song. I didn't think it was for... I mean, I guess it could be for himself. I actually saw that Morris for Michael. Like, I saw... So I was going to oh, ask you, why do you up. think... Why do you think the song ends with Happy Birthday? And I actually think it's a happy birthday for Michael. Yeah. And all the Michaels who will never see birthdays because of... And this is when... The movie ends, and then, like in the yes. credits, we see actual fo footage of Jonathan yeah. Larson and Tick Tick Boom, especially like when he's like rapping with the hat backwards. When you're like, <laughs> yeah. stop, that was fun. Um, and we get to "Come to Your Senses" by Jasmine Sullivan, and that's the end. Oh my of the God, movie. Jasmine Sullivan, her right, her "Come to Your Senses" is amazing, is oh. beautiful, and that's that's the movie. Okay, so we're gonna do something. A little different. I have I have a couple things real quick. So we'll talk about the movie, yeah. uh, like its reception and a uh, little bit of uh, John Larson. Um, so John Larson basically revolutionized musical theater and like the way uh, by showing in a way that had never really been shown before. And 
telling stories with it that had never that it had never been used to tell. Um, so he actually died of an aortic dissection Dice, on the okay. day of Rent's first off Broadway preview performance. Um, so the difference between an aneurysm and a dissection, um, an aneurysm, I sort of explained it in episode forty. Yes. Scrubs. Scrubs. Thank you. Yes, because that's what she had. Uh, well, she didn't have an aortic aneurysm. She had a neural aneurysm. Um, but yeah, so an aneurysm we kind of described there. I botched it a little bit, but basically it's a bulging of a uh, blood vessel uh, caused by thinning of the walls. An aortic dissection is when it actually like separates. Like there's an actual like rupture in the wall. But it's different mm. than when an aneurysm ruptures. That's like a different thing. An aortic dissection could be caused by Is it a, a like number. a difference like a from like a burst and a tear? Yes, it's like a burst okay. versus a tear. Um an aortic dissection is specifically on your aorta. So an aneurysm can be really on any major blood vessel or um or any major artery, but it's the Fatal ones are usually in your brain. Um, his was in his chest, like on his aorta. Um, so you usually get like chest pain and stuff like that with it. Um, but yeah, basically his aorta teared and or tore and he bled out and died um, on the day of Rent's first off She says TV with a smile like a serial I, killer? Shut the fuck up. Anyway, um, so he did receive he did. three posthumous Tony Awards and uh a Pulitzer Prize, a posthumous Pulitzer Prize for drama for the rock musical Rent. Um, but yeah, so the film, um, the film received okay. It actually had lower ratings than I expected. Um, so on Rotten Tomatoes, it had an approval rating of 88%, um, with an average rating of 7.6 out of 10. Um, the Metacritic, it actually only had a 74 out of 100. Um, but it did win a bunch of awards. So it won um, a Best Director Award, a Best Actor Award for Andrew Garfield, of course. Um, yeah. Best yeah. Editing, Desert Palm Award, um, another Best Actor for Andrew Garfield, as well as Top 10 Movies of the Year. Um, and then it was nominated for a number of others, including like a Golden Globe, Hollywood Critics Association Awards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the thing that I really wanted to talk about, so... The movie itself is about Jonathan Larson, so I feel like there's not a ton. Um, and we've already talked about him with Rent, so there's not a ton more that I want to add to that. But I did want to talk to you, Campbell, instead about... That's me. Especially because Jonathan Larson died so young and so suddenly. Um, I wanted to kind of like explore, like take a few minutes to explore just like the implications of his work in this film adaptation. Yeah, that's... So I have, I, Raven, I love that. I have two questions that I want us to discuss. Okay. First, and I can, I can give my answer for these first if you want time to think about it. But Probably. first, what do you think is the significance of him writing his works in the music of popular culture specifically? And okay. two, what impact do you think this film might have on the future of musical films and film adaptations? Okay, for the first one, uh, I would say that I think a lot of audiences, when they see, when they think of musicals, they think like campy, show tuny yep. stuff like that. Um, but musicals, I think, and we talked about it a lot during the Les Mis episodes with Lorinda, that like musicals, they're able to take the like the the um uh, the emotions that you're able to feel between music and like acting as a performance and they like in an additive fashion make it so that you I don't know there's like perspectives and feelings that yeah. you cannot feel from just one of those things I exactly think yeah what Jonathan Larson did was able to take that and expand it to other audiences and like different kinds of music. There's different kinds of music that touches people in different ways. There's not just one way to do a musical, one kind of mm -hmm. like musical tone that you have to do. He was being way more alternative with the music he was representing, representing which was very like the music of the times, the music of the now that like should be used to describe how people are feeling and how voices should be like heard in a very contemporary sense and i think that's like really what he's done for musicals and like for that first question amazing i i very much agree and i the thing that i'll add is that the the idea with musicals so musicals like the basic formula quote unquote is that like 
you talk until the emotion becomes too much and then you sing until the emotion becomes too much and then you dance. And that's generally how like mu the, the format the musicals follow. And again, like what you were talking about, like that music then needs to mirror what you're feeling. And when you have an entire generation of people who the music they relate to is the music of popular culture or like rock music, and that's how they're expressing their feelings, like that's the way to tell their story. And like there are certain, like there are whole groups and, and demographics of people that like their story just can't be told by the musical theater music of the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Like, like the, I think music evolves. Theater, music, music evolves because so musical evolves should as people well. People evolve. So musicals should as well. Thank you. I could not get that thought yeah. out. Um, and like also, like he. Um, through, like, his privileged and lived experiences that, like, in the, like, counterculture that, like, he surrounded mm -hmm. himself, like, that you know, like, the bohemian life and things like that, he was able, through his work, to educate, inform, and support and uplift, uh, you know, a group of society that has been traditionally shunned mm -hmm. and, like, really got people like kind of like around that yes and he, and i think like he communicated with people in other situations successfully in the language that they know best yes and i think i think the works of tick tick boom and rent um well yeah there, there's definitely some uh pitfalls that you could that you yeah. could call out or some we were very critical of the 2000 film rent <laughs> we very much were very very um, critical about it but like we're not talking about like the... that was the film version <laughs> yeah and at the end of the day bo -bo, i think bo -bo, bo -bo. it's honestly a great exercise in allyship like it's literally showing like hey like the people around you have a different experience than you they have a different background than you there are different issues that they're facing that while you may be tangential to you might be impacted by it's not affecting you in the same way it's affecting them and i think just the way that they showed, the way that he showed how he dealt with that and mm -hmm. how he lived through that and learned to understand that and contextualize it for the rest of the world. Is really I important. think uh, Jonathan Larson's, one of his greatest uh, contributions to musical theater and like media and like art in general is uh, being able to contextualize empathy to people. Yes, yes. And uh, one of the, this is sort of a theory that I have, but I was listening to, especially okay. listening to 3090. 3090 to me directly reflects a lot of the music that we listened to in like our middle school, in like early high school years. And I really, I really think that. Is that why I liked it so much? <laughs> I honestly, so it's like, so Tick Tick Boom came out in 1990, I believe, uh, or, or shortly after 1990. 91, so around that. 91, now. yeah. And then Rent came out, I believe, in 1992. Um, and yeah, please look that up. Um, but I, I really think. 1990 Tick Tick uh, Boom was to do. Was like was the who lives in New York in 1990, mm -hmm. and then uh, Rent was um, oh, where is he? Boop, boop. Uh, the first workshop for Rent was 1993, which honestly okay. was a great year for America. And why? Raven? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> why? Raven? That's the year Campbell was born. <laughs> I was going to say that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really think that Early the nights. music that Jonathan Larson's influence on rock musical theater i honestly think led a lot to the music we we got in the early aughts and like the early to mid aughts because if you think about like that was when like alt rock and punk rock became a bigger thing um in the 2000s and you got and bands what like is panning at the rock? disco fallout yeah. boy but like what that, is like, alt rock and like punk it's just rock. theater kid rock like it's it, just... i mean it is theater kid rock but it's <laughs> counterculture rock it's just like it's counter taking rock, uh, it's yes. taking a lot of the emotions and feelings people feel but feel like they can't express because it's not like mainstream or anything like that and like expressing it like for you but then, yes. of course, those things become popular and then become mainstream. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. But I'm this is like in those... Purely emotion, empathetic. Conception. 
Yeah. 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 And I think I, I, I don't know if this is a theory that other people have had. I don't know if people have already talked about this. Maybe they have, and maybe I'm just out of the loop because I'm not in musical theater, but I would really believe that Jonathan, that Jonathan Larson Play, like his works played a contributory role to the rise of like specifically the form of punk rock that we saw in like the 2000s but like also you th- like i don't know just like musicals in general you think about like very like very successful like musical artists mm-hmm. and you like for some of them that are very like technically amazing you like ask them about like you know inspirations and things like that and like so much of it comes from like musical theater like so much just like a prime example no two examples and they sang together in a carpool karaoke but like oh prime examples seth mcfarlane ariana grande oh my god seth mcfarlane is so freaking talented yeah have you heard them sing suddenly seymour together no but that sounds amazing it exists but like that's why I'm like so excited for Ariana Grande to be in Wicked, because oh my like gosh, yes. people like even like people love musicals. People yeah. love musicals, even though like you know maybe their work isn't like as like reminiscent of that. They're mm-hmm. able to. Okay, now we're just getting into like why musicals are so great. Jonathan Larson <laughs> specifically for your first question, um, he's been able to contemporize musicals to the masses in a way that like supports and uplifts what's actually happening happening in the world yeah Um, what was your second question (laughs) my second question we can go a little shorter on this one but my second question was what impact do you think this film might have on the future of musical films and the specific reason i'm asking this is because like we talked about like other than again like chicago or like those those upper echelon film musical adaptations um which i think this quickly soars to um I think this this musical, this film, is one of the best film adaptations of a stage musical, especially that I've ever seen, because it specifically is one of the few that, again, uh, actually like adapts literally adapts the stage musical to the medium of film in a way that we don't see in a lot of other areas, while still keeping the stage musical like I think true to form, yeah. um, and I think that especially when we look back at Limerell Miranda's other works, um, like the way they filmed Hamilton for like the film release. And the fact that like that, they did that like a film, like they actually took multiple productions and stuff like that and spliced them together and found the best shots and all the other stuff and got angles that you wouldn't be able to get for a stage musical. Um, and I think like Limerell Miranda, if he continues on this journey i think could be our next like howard ashman and i would fucking love that i will say my answer to this question it's more of a logistics kind of thing i think this Mm -hmm. just supports um musicals in the medium of streaming services i think that TikTok is having to offer um recent like this past week on twitter i saw josh gad say hey if like the members uh the the cast of um the book of mormon did a show and like made it available on streaming services who would be interested literally For everyone sure. yes. i think this is just like adding to like the hamilton tick tick boom which mm-hmm. like good for lynn manuel miranda from like you know being so core to these things um but it's leading to increased ex- accessibility to very like to musicals to the masses i think yes. that's what tick tick boom is helping with the specifically the netflix film adaptation Exactly, because at the end of the day, there are a lot, like, I believe education is a right, and I think musical education should be a right. Uh, well, both, neither of those things are treated like that currently, but I yeah. believe they both should be. Yeah, um, I agree. And, Check out education and again, the, through music. The, exactly, and the Dario Foundation and MH Opus. Um, but Mr. I... Mr. Holland's Opus, yes. Yeah. Um, but I, I think... This goes back to that, where it's like, yes, there are a lot of people that want to pursue a career in theater or music or art, and they move to New York City or LA or something like that. But there's just as many people who don't have that opportunity to begin with. And I think just the physical access to things like Tick, Tick, Boom, to things like Hamilton, to just see this whole world outside 
of I mean, you what see, is available to you. You see Moana, Frozen, like Disney movies that just like people yeah. like are like in awe about. It's just like mm-hmm. you. There's so much more. That there's people so can much see. more. And I, yeah, and I, I really hope that this begins a trend of, because I, I really think film adaptations of musicals specifically were kind of going into a lull because like for a while they weren't super popular and then we got like Les Mis and Cats and those were okay. They <laughs> happened. They happened. Um, but I, I really think if we can get more but now we're going to films tick, tick, like boom. this. We're going to, I'm. We I can mean, have the, a whole era. I mean, Cynthia Erivo oh my as Alphaba. God. I like, I cannot even fathom what that's going I'm to so be. I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. We so excited. were like, we talked about briefly because we were going to faint the color purple. We were like talking about <laughs> so many like musical, like film adaptations that are coming up. And people were like, why do we always have to do a film adaptation? And I was like, because we want because people to see it. Because we don't access anything else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we live in Virginia and Oregon. Yes, like sometimes yeah. like at the, like in, like at the Altria Theater, like people will come and like see Hamilton and stuff like that. But like, not everyone has that, but everyone deserves yeah. to see it because it's like so. It's we believe it's such important work and so incredible. We just want everyone mm-hmm. to like enjoy what we're enjoying, and that's what I have to say about your questions, Raven. I loved that. So, okay. Campbell, mm-hmm. what are we going to be playing today? Okay, so uh, I will be playing the clarinet. Raven will be playing violin, and we'll be playing why, why. Why? What? Who? When? Where? Why? How? This other <laughs> one, but didn't have like the WH, whatever. Oh, okay, okay, so, okay, okay, be back soon. Bye. Hey everyone, in addition to our other nonprofit partners, I would like to do a quick plug for the Dodario Foundation. The Dodario Foundation is a nonprofit grant making organization that provides monetary and product support to high quality music instruction programs on the front line to improve access to music education. And every single cent raised goes directly to getting kids involved in community music programs, acquiring and maintaining instruments, providing college scholarships, and supporting new innovations in music education across 41 U.S. states and 180 cities. They accept monetary donations, of course, but also instruments. So if you have an old instrument that you no longer use, please consider donating it to the Dodario Foundation, where they can get it into the hands of a student in need. However you're able to contribute, you can go to dodariofoundation.org slash about slash donate. That is Dodario Foundation, D-A-D-D-A-R-I-O, foundation.org slash about slash donate. Now please enjoy the sultry sounds of me and Campbell destroying music. We were so together. Well, we I don't were. know if you had to adjust. I know what I did for like some of the eighth notes. I just played the downbeats. I, you know what? I don't blame you. Sight because readings. There's a lot of them. Hard. Um, yeah, and I have all quarter notes, so I can't talk. Mm, where should we go now? Uh, okay. So we just played to seventy-eight. I'm thinking. We start at eighty-nine. I- I was literally thinking the same thing. I made a vow. Yeah. Okay, we'll do 89 to the key change. I made a vow to I'm 29. Yeah. Okay. To 20... Um, I'm 29, yes. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be, we're gonna be stopping at 114. Yes. So we're going to finish. We're going to finish one thirteen and then stop at the double line. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. One, two, three, two, two, three. Okay, so I definitely got ahead. No, no, but you also have like a measure and a beat of rest when I don't. That's true, but I think when I... I mean, there's a little bit of a lag, but when I finished, it sounded like you were starting 112. So I, I think it was a beat or two ahead. Not like a home measure Oh, that's anything, fine. But, a yeah. lot of that I couldn't play, so I think you should move on. Um, the, Fair. <laughs> I, this next part is, like, very similar. Honestly... So I think, I think key, we should start at 134 does... and go to the end. 
I was going to say the key does change, and I think 134... Yeah, I'd be down with that. Over and over and over, that, I'll get it After right. that, it's the same rhythm, but the key is different. Yeah, so I think we should yeah. do that to the end. At least for me, yeah. Cool. Our key, right. Why would we change King's key signatures differently? No, no, I meant because my key is now what your key was. I mean, we are in the same key, it's just transposed. Yeah, I know, but like, yeah, the I way it you. looks, Campbell, shut I mean, you're right. But, like, shut up. <laughs> All right. One, two, three, two, two, three. Please stop. Yes. Did you end on 151? Yes, I did. Can we start at 148 uh, and go to that? 148? Yes, we can, because I love playing that. I've actually I, been crushing that part. That, those little, like, that little 16 no, no, no. Oh, no, no. Notes. Yeah, it sounds so good. You've been doing very well. With I'm really notes. excited. Uh, the A flat G, uh, F. The da 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 G. Also, Campbell, you've honestly been doing really good on the on the eighth notes. Especially, like, at the beginning, when you were, like, first starting out. Like, oh, I yeah. I could actually... You, like, you're it's doing... When it, it's when it goes across the register for me that I'm just, like, only playing down. Notes. What is a register? For okay, you. a register is when I start off with like, say I play like C, D, E, F, G on the clarinet, and then yeah, I have to G go is like up. All open, right? Yeah. It's when okay. I do like the key like above the thumb key. It's called the register. Oh, that's so when right. I go I to like that. not a lot of fingers to a lot of fingers, but I go higher. Wild. Is the best way to explain. The it. clarinet, it's like. Woodwinds are such interesting instruments, and like there's such the a the science feat behind of, like, them mechanics. is super cool. Yeah, which like so are so are string instruments, but in a very different way. I squeaked Beautiful. before. One, two, three, two, two, three. Mm. I mean, I crushed it. Yeah, I couldn't hear you for the last bit, but I can only assume that you did. Yeah, I did. I Maybe. will only assume that you did. I mean, you're you'll, amazing, you'll listen back because you edit this podcast. <laughs> True. And sometimes there's so many times that I listen back and I'm like, ooh, we sounded good. Yeah. Especially because a lot of times like it's really just the lag and like all I have to do is like shift one of our audios by like half a second or something and like they perfectly line up and they sound amazing. Yeah. Damn you, copyright. Um, right? Raven, how would you rate this being called on a scale of one to ten? Oh my god. Um, I don't think I can give it anything less than a nine. Fuck it, ten. Uh, ten same. out of ten. Ten out of ten. I ten loved this ten. so much. I'm like, oh, this is my new favorite. Like. Instantly. Of all time. I was just like, I was, not that I was like surprised because I was like, oh, who is in it and stuff like that. I was just like surprised with how incredible this was and how I did not know this existed before. Because, like, I mean, yes, yeah. the, the musical, ad- the movie, the Moody V adaptation, like, adds, like, very different things. It's not like the stage show. Yeah. But, like, even with just, like, the story and the music, I'm just, like, that alone, I'm, like, this is my new favorite thing. Yeah. Yeah, this, this musical is important in so many different ways. Like, one in the method of storytelling via musical theater that Jonathan Larson was employing, the nature of the story and the characters that it was following and talking about, um, the method of presentation, like the physical way he performed it, and then just how freaking fantastic this film adaptation is as a film adaptation. Like, just so many parts of it, and like, Limeron Miranda himself like talks a lot about how he was directly inspired by Jonathan Larson. Like I think he said that it was either Rent or Tick Tick Boom that he went to see on his seventeenth birthday, and that directly influenced um, a lot of his career. And like yeah. he was also deeply influenced by Stephen Sondheim. So I feel like this film is just the perfect culmination of so much creativity, so much passion, so much talent, and love of musical theater and. We just, we love to see it. Same. Yeah. Campbell. 
I'm <laughs> letting Where this can happen. You find us. I'm letting you do this. <laughs> I recognize that. Um, you can find us. Obviously, you're already listening to us, but this may be not for you if you want to share with other people that aren't listening on the same platforms as you. There's a lot of ways that you can find us. Uh, you can find us wherever podcasts are found. That would be Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Art Radio, Pandora, Podbean, um, anywhere that you can find podcasts. And on whatever platform you are so listening to that you so choose, if you have the ability, which for most of them you do, to either like, comment, rate, or review us, please do. And if we hope you like this and hope you rate us like five stars, if not... Um, I mean, we just how you feel we did. But if you honestly like believe that we can do better, you can email us at boozicals at gmail dot com, b o o z i c a l s, and we'd happy like happy to take into consideration. Or you can DM us and follow us at our Instagram at boozicals at b o o z i c a l s. And yeah, I like to Photoshop fun pictures for this kind of stuff. And you know, the higher we're rated, the higher we're able to share. What we are trying to do, which is, you know, spread music education into those that, like, do not have as good of access to music education. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you the, uh, do, do, do your thing. Do your thing. Uh, but, but yeah, anyway, this has been fun. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Larson is an incredibly talented soul who was taken... Far too soon, but also what he contributed is still amazing in its own right and like literally changed musical theater forever. Um, and I just really love that. I don't know how other musical theater people feel about this. I mean, no community is a monolith, but I personally feel that this film was a fantastic way to memorialize him and to share one of his greatest works with the world. Agreed. Bye, listeners. Bye, friends.